are you doing guys? Welcome back to The Distilled Truth. Now, we did promise, albeit a little while ago, that we were going to do some podcasting on this channel. And in the hideout for this episode, I've got an old friend and colleague of mine, Max Oswald. Max and I have worked together for on and off 10, 12 years. Uh, and until recently, Max was head of bars at the NED here in the city of London. Uh, if you're not aware of the NED, it's a massive hospitality operation right in the centre of the business district. It's got 14 bars, all with completely different propositions, over 200 bartenders. I think they were doing something like two million pound a month turnover on just on drinks alone. They've obviously been hit extremely hard by the lockdown and COVID-19 and Max was unfortunately made redundant. Now with that said, I feel like this conversation was very positive overall. And if you don't work in hospitality, I feel like this will give you a really good insight as to what is going on in the industry during this pandemic. And if you do work in the industry and are going through a similar situation, I really hope you can take something positive and constructive away from this conversation. You know, Max is a pretty stoic guy. He's got a great outlook on life. He's been in the industry a long time and he's worked and trained with some of the best. So I really hope you enjoy this. Before we get into it, just a quick note and an apology. About an hour in, there's a 20 minute section where the sound quality goes down. We lose the mics for about 20 minutes. The sound quality comes back and during that 20 minutes, you can hear everything. It's just not quite as good quality as the rest of the video. I wanted the first one to be perfect and I could have cut that 20 minutes out, but I also felt like the content was more important than the quality. I, I think you'll agree when you get to that section, but persevere, the sound quality does come back. And one final note, I have got another four videos in the can that I'm very slowly editing. I'm sorry, I'm still learning. But one of those includes a podcast with a chap called Declan McGurk, who in a similar situation to Max, was director of bars at the Savoy Hotel until recently. And we've also got a really fun video about how to make the perfect martini, or at least make one element of a martini perfect. So that is well worth keeping an eye out for. But without any further ado, here is episode one of the Distilled Truth podcast. Enjoy. Episode one of which I hope is many Distilled Truth podcasts. Max Oswald is joining us in the hideout today. Max, welcome. Hello, mate. Let's crack on, shall we? Let's uh, see. I mean, I've known you for 12, 12 years. Years, yeah. And we met at the Electric in Portobello Port, Road. Port Road, one of the uh, Soho House members club. Um, you were green. Green, very green, wet behind the ears, very a wet behind bit. the ears. <laughs> <laughs> we sorted that out pretty quickly, didn't we? Let's well, let's let, tell us a build up to that because I don't really know much about it either, to be honest. So yeah, so uh, I think I've been in the game one way or another since I was fifteen. Yeah. Um, fell into being a waiter at cafes and restaurants, yeah. and uh, decided that that was more fun than doing any studying. Came from a family of teachers, so basically just went against it as hard as I could. Yeah. Uh, and then pre-meeting you, I'd moved up to Yorkshire where I was running a restaurant uh, um, and bar in a boutique hotel. Then got the missus pregnant, moved back to London, started my bartending career, fell under your tutelage, and from there on it was, yeah, getting right stuck into the bar industry in London. Yeah, I kind of pointed you in the right direction and yeah you well you gave of, me the hookup that you I ran think, with it from yeah, there really didn't you yeah you gave me the hookup that i think had the most impact which was going from electric uh parts of the house group into match yeah which and that was uh, who was the group so head bartender. alex orwin alex was the group orwin. Head bartender. shout out to alex shout out to alex he's in australia i think these days uh working for paul mant over at maryvale oh, nice. um, shout out to paul mant yeah uh <laughs> and yeah, I interviewed with him at Socho just before the fire. Right. Uh, and he put me in at Match W1. Yeah. Rest in peace. Just for to put that in context before the fire, um, a club I used to run actually, it, it's called Socho in just off Old Street Roundabout in, in East London, um, burnt to the ground. Four floors of, Four, five floors, wasn't five it? Floors. Has it East Rooms, downstairs East Rooms well. Club upstairs. Yeah. And someone left a candle burning one night and the whole lot went There's up There's a video of it that you yeah, can probably find on YouTube. It is, yeah, because I remember the office was under the road, like it was a bit of a bunker. Mm -hmm. So all the CCTV was like protected. And yeah, just, I think they know who did it as well, didn't they? Well, but, I think they, the waitress was 
seen missing that candle as she was tidying up at the end of the night. And yeah, uh, yeah that was that was I mean, you know, to put it into context, match group at that point, uh they were it as far as the bar industry. That, oh, that like, doubt, yeah. like and you know, I think the, the, the legacy of match group still exists in yourself, myself, then across the planet. Like you've got multiple operations run by ex match bartenders, not yeah. just bars these days as well, hospitality firms and yeah. restaurants and all yeah. sorts. Um and Socho was kind of I don't know, I think Jonathan Downey, founder of Match Group, would say it was a pivotal moment for Match. That was kind of the beginning of the end, really, wasn't it? Well, the birth of a new beginning, really. Yeah. Um and I, well we're gonna get on some milk and honey later. Yeah. But um yeah, I guess JD went on to do Street Feast and Dinorama. Dinorama. And yeah, he's I London mean, he's Union. Probably doing better than that better now. <laughs> I think he would very openly say that yeah. going well, into maybe, the maybe yeah, up until up until um lockdown. But yeah. Yeah. So anyway, after, so going from match, were you at trailer? So yeah, I did match for a year. Um and was entertaining talks with Hawksmoor to go and work with them, which eventually did happen. Uh, handed my notice in at Match to go and work for, for Hawksmoor and got a phone call from uh, one of the big bosses at, at Match who said, instead of leaving, why don't you go and run Trailer Happiness for me? Nice. Um, for those who don't that, know, Trailer that Happiness, Rick? that was Rick. Yeah. Um, Shout out Rick. For those of you who don't know, Trailer has been there for pushing 20 years I almost. Guess it must be uh, um, early 2000s. Early 2000s, would it yeah. open? Tiny little lounge bar, Portobello Road, back in Portobello Road. Uh, rum themed up until, you know, very recently it had the most extensive rum collection in, in Europe. So that was a real thing to, to get your head around rum and the first ever proper rum club in the UK. First proper tiki bar outside of. Yeah, so I mean, it never. Of a hotel, really, was well, it? Jonathan and Rick never wanted to call it a tiki bar. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, they got, uh, they weren't very happy when I was, was. pushing it. <laughs> it really was a tiki bar, but it wasn't, you know, people, when you say tiki in London, people think of places like Mahiki or yeah. uh, Trader Vic's. Well, I mean, Mahiki didn't exist no, exactly. before Trailer. Exactly. So. I think the only one that you would have said was, was Trader Vic's. Yeah. At, which was, was in was Hilton, at, wasn't it? The Hilton. On um, Park Lane. Um, which has an amazing heritage. Trader Vic himself inventing most of the most famous tiki drinks that people know, but it was, for want of a better way of saying it, it didn't quite have the credibility that the originals had because it was a hotel bar, because it yeah. wasn't aimed at, at kind of the right parts of the industry to give it that credibility. But it was a Mayfair as well. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a bit more exclusive, whereas I think Tiki Bars really were always about um, being super accessible. Yeah. Like they, they were born Sp out of escapism in, in, in 40s America. Yeah. It was all about not thinking about the war, not thinking about terrible things, about escaping to a tropical paradise. And that's... Absolutely. And so Trailer was... It had a kind of, uh, and has to this day, um, shout out to Sly who bought it from, from yeah, Rick and John. Yeah, it's ownership now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's got a real kind of 70s lounge bar vibe to it as well. It feels like someone's front 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 room. Yeah. Um, and that was, I think, when I when I went to run it, very quickly you take ownership of that space. Sure. And there's there's like a long, long list of great bartenders who've been it's involved in that place. It's got a massive alumni, hasn't it? Really? Yeah. yeah. You know, like I could I could reel off a load of names, but uh, I, won't, I won't bother because... We'll just spend the whole chat talking about <laughs> other people. Um, it was it was an amazing year. I learned a lot. I got fully immersed into every aspect of the industry, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I opened myself up to a whole new world of, of drinks making because it was, we took the drinks seriously, but it was very much guest facing. Yeah. It was much more about enjoying the people and the people having a nice time and being relaxed than it was about going mm. on and on about how mm. many vintage cocktails you know the recipe for and sure. boutique spirits you know yeah. we got we got our geek on in a big way about rum uh -huh. uh, and I, I actually ended up bringing in the head bartender from Mahiki to help me run the place who eventually uh, Alex Mazuris okay. who is now global brand Alex. ambassador I believe for Don Q rums um, he's now living out in LA with his nice. staffs and his new wife um, and yeah it was it was an amazing experience I mean I don't think I could have done more than a year. And I think if you look at the alumni, most people do one year at Trailer. Is that a fact? Yeah. Uh, I think Ricky Broderick probably lasted the longest. He's the guy that I took over from. Right. Um, but it, it takes it takes its toll on you, that place. It's uh, it's, a, it's a proper party bar. Well, and, we were uh, chatting the other day, the last time I was I was down there, just popped in on a like a Tuesday night or something right. to say hi. And you got absolutely beasted and yeah. ended up... <laughs> you, I pulled you behind the bar to make me a random like 25 meters yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. which um, is one of those places, I guess, isn't it? You could just get 
shafted out of the blue. Absolutely. You know, it, it could be a Wednesday night and you've got a couple of people booked, which was never really a big thing, bookings. And then, you know, it's West London, so 25 young socialites turn up yeah. and want to get absolutely smashed as quickly as possible and listen to some banging hip hop, which was basically yeah. what we did all the time down there. So, going from trailer. So, trailer ended. And, uh, yeah, that was that was that was heavy going for me so i i jumped out of the the cocktail scene for a little bit and came to work for you again oh yeah of course you did yeah <laughs> i totally forgot about yeah. that <laughs> yeah um i needed i needed a bit of rest from uh the heavy heavy uh toll of, of the cocktail game I mean, you and jumped into our pit of yeah so you were you were running the boozers at that point yeah i say boozers they're more than boozers um and more than gastro pubs i don't think we ever called them gastro pubs just I mean, I don't think people watching the channel know this about me, but I had a few pubs uh, in East London in the, uh, what, 2009, I think I opened. Yeah. A pub called The Hemingway on Victoria Park Road um, with a few guys from... X-Match Group as X -Match well. X-Match Group, yeah, yeah. all ex-Milk and Honey bartenders. Um, they'll probably appreciate me not mentioning that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave them incognito. You can yeah. do some research online if you um, really want to make it out. And so we opened that in 2009 and when you came to work for me in, must have been 2011? Maybe a little after. No, sounds about right. I get very patchy. Yeah, I think it was, because we, were you there when we opened Hunter? Yeah. I came on board as the Hunter was opening. I think that was 2011 then we yeah. opened that. Um, um, or late, maybe late 2010 actually, I can't quite possibly. I don't know, it's all a bit. So I did that with you for just over a year. And that yeah. was kind of helping helping you and the boys run both sites. So I wasn't attached to one. I'd, I'd flip between the two. Yeah, we all kind of flipped all, all over the shop. Yeah. Um, um, and then after kind of resetting a little bit, because it was a reset for me. Like I said, trailer tickets toll. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think at that point I had two kids. Um, I now have four. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a different pace. Yeah. More. The nights you know, weren't as late. Yeah. The Sunday afternoons were heavy and even though the bar industry used to come and hang with us at those pubs it wasn't to it get wasn't, smashed out of their no, faces and come and do lock Sunday roast or something wasn't it yeah yeah I mean you know as, as a good pub is it was a place to to relax and enjoy yourself as mm -hmm. opposed to show off and get crazy every single night yeah. although that did happen occasionally um, so I did that with you for a little while and then Hawksmoor came and knocking again okay um, so anyone uh, who listening who doesn't know Hawksmoor is a uh, I don't really want to use chain's the word not the chain. Words. People have described it as a chain, and I think uh, Will and Hugh, the owners, have yeah. have pushed back on that. Not in a nasty way. I th you know, there's nothing wrong with a chain if a chain is done well. But they're a group, and so essentially, they started off as a small restaurant in East London, steak restaurant. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they had a, a, a chap called Nick Strangeway involved who encouraged them to push the drink side of things mm. as well. Um, and very quickly, very quickly, in fact, brought in a load of ex-match people. Yeah. And the cocktail game became... Who were the first guys to get? Liam, Liam Davey. So Liam Sam Davey Foxwell. got involved. Tom Foxwell Tom got Foxwell. involved. Drew Gladwell, that whole that whole gang. Um, Tom Foxwell's another ex-trailer alumni. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, they it really blossomed for them, mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole drink side of thing, to the point that, you know, of, of all the restaurant groups that are out there and all the restaurants that are out there, I would argue that Hawksmoor was the first one to really say... You should do your drinks properly too. You should yeah. put as much thought into beverage as you do into food. And they think they've been awarded for it they, on multiple, multiple times. Multiple so times, yeah, yeah. Their, their original site, which eventually they, that was originally the head office in the basement, they converted into the first Hawksmoor bar. So the first one was Commercial Road, wasn't it? Commercial Road in Shoreditch. Commercial Street, sorry. I always get confused. It's Commercial Street. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah you're right, it is. Uh, Commercial Road's not very nice. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, yeah, they converted the basement into a proper bar. Yeah. And that's now one multiple awards for best restaurant bar and uh ali reynolds ali reynolds was there phil duffy was there oh, um, shout out to phil big shout out to phil uh ex heartbreak hotel ex <laughs> alumni yep um yeah multiple great great operators have been through there um most recently one of my one of my kind of uh hawksmoor trainees took over who's now gone over to new york to open their their first ever international site which was just about to open yep. pre-lockdown. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And they're now that sitting was... there waiting. Mm. 
Oh my god, it's like heartbreaking. It is. Yeah. So you were at, you were at Air Street, they weren't you? So I was at their Piccadilly yeah. uh, restaurant, which, which is, were, they tried to go. They go in a bit of a different direction. Yeah. They so they a brought a guy fish. called Mitch Tonks on board, who yeah. um, runs the Seahorse down in um, Brixham, mm. down on the coast. And the idea there was, I mean, with Hawksmoor, every single site had its own identity. Right. So, you know, you've got Spitalfields, which is always a bit more rough and a bit more ready, yeah. a bit more kind of friendly East London. And yeah. then you had somewhere like Seven Dials in Covent Garden, which definitely had a bit more of a tourist and a theatre trade. Um, I think it's my favourite, Seven Dials. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, they, they are all beautiful. And then when they opened Air Street, which was their first... It was the first one that felt like they were they were really stepping up right. into into the big leagues because it was, you know, it's a 240-cover restaurant yeah. in the heart of Piccadilly Circus. You look out the window of the bar, you can see the lights in Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> it's And it's stunning. Like, it yeah, is, it's is you know, I remember... So I was there for five years in total, and I remember every Jeez, single time really? I closed... Yeah. Wowzers. Every single time I closed the place, and it was just me in the building... Little. Yeah, I'd have a little moment where I'm like, this place is absolutely beautiful. Like, I feel ab- really, really privileged to be running a place that not only is the quality of product absolutely on point, yeah. and it always was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think one thing in our game is that you've got this constant push and pull between what you can afford to do, how you how you can afford to do it, yeah. like what, you're gonna, what you're willing to spend to make the money. Sure. And they very rarely sacrificed. Occasionally, we'd do things that might have seemed like, oh, is it cutting corners? But yeah. we'd only ever do it if, if the quality was on point. I heard that um, they decided to go more fish focused at Air Street because Ginger Pig literally couldn't that's supply exactly right. them with enough, well, that's <laughs> with enough so, mates. So yeah, so, so when, I don't know how much of this we're supposed to talk about, but this is, this is, this is years old I mean, now. if I've heard about it, then it's probably yeah. so when, fairly, fairly common knowledge. When Air Street opened, Ginger Pig, who are now kind of synonymous with good meat, they've, they've got their, their butcheries in, in East London and all over the place. People know. About yeah, you Ginger see Pig. them on like, Christmas Eve. There's like a queue of hundreds of people waiting to get their, yeah. waiting to get their Christmas turkey. Yeah, and sausage rolls, which is the thing that they seem to be most famous right. for for some reason. Um, they came on board with Hawksmoor very early, bringing them really interesting, like high quality meat. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's Hawksmoor's, you know, got a very good understanding of meat. Yeah. Really, really good. They were the first sort of big restaurant to rock a Josper as well I think weren't they yeah they were the, yeah they were the first place to do Josper at scale right uh, lots and lots of restaurants over the years have, have had a Josper grill and kind of done nice yeah. interesting little things with it but yeah. the the way in which Hawksmoor understands steak you know under the tutelage of uh, Richard Turner mm-hmm. shout out to Big Rich um, they yeah they really understood the way to do it properly and at, and at scale and at Hawksmoor like you know at Air Street sorry 240 covers we could do 400 plus in yeah. one evening people didn't have to wait a long time for their steak and steak takes time to cook they know what they're doing yeah so yeah when that when when air street opened the the, the big thing was uh ginger pig couldn't keep up yeah. they just couldn't keep up it was you know it was insane the amount of cows that were that, that were being uh yeah well looked after until the end of their <laughs> until the end of their fruitful life um and they brought in a couple of two other meat suppliers, but those were very much rare breed. So right. it was it wasn't about bringing in another bulk supplier. It was about having for some the other options cuts and stuff yeah. for the more premium stuff. And then fish. Not to say that ginger pig isn't premium. They're super premium. S- super premium. Almost, yeah. all, arguably too premium yeah. sometimes. Um, so yeah, Mitch Tonks came on board. They've got a guy called Nigel who does all the does all the uh, kind of the sourcing of the fish. Every every day he would call up the head chef and be yeah. like, right, this is what's in, this is what not, what's not in. Stunning, 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 stunning food. Um, so Air Street had that more that slight more of a fish lean to it. It was also one of the first sites they'd done that was above ground. Uh, uh, of course, yeah. like so, so Spitalfields was well, above not, ground, yeah, but, but the bar was underground, very, yeah, yeah, very exactly. enclosed. Um, Seven Dolls is a basement. Yeah. Guild Hall is a basement. Yeah. Uh, and those were the three that were open when Air Street Number Four opened, mm-hmm. and it was. Oh, did Guildhall open? Yeah, before that. I yeah, thought Guildhall was, was. I thought that was a fourth. No, actually. Guildhall was like three. Um, that's Guildhall in the city for anyone who has returned to their offices. <laughs> Not many. Nope. Um, Not many. And it was lighter. It was area. It was bigger. We needed to be able to serve people fast. So yeah, yeah. they brought fish on board, and and arguably to this day, I would say that the monkfish that you can get at Hawksmoor Air Street is the best dish on any Hawksmoor. Nice. Menu. It's beautiful. I mean, this is a drinks channel, so, so let's talk about. <laughs> so with let's the drinks. About drinks. Um, so yeah, so I I started off there. I actually went in as a bartender. Um, Adam McGurk, another ex match guy, was the bar manager. He'd been trying to poach me for a few years since yeah. match. Um, he wanted me to go on board when they opened Air Street as a head bartender, right. but I decided to go and run a pub. 
um, which I never regret. <laughs> uh, and so um, I came in as a bartender. Then I think it was 18 months later, I was ABM, assistant bar manager. Right. Um, then Adam moved on to Pastures New. He went to work for Jason Atherton at City nice. Social. Uh, I'll let Adam talk to you about that one day. <laughs> um, and I took over, yeah, I think it was it was just before my two year mark, I took mm -hmm. over as bar manager. So for the following three years, I grew into the role essentially of group bar manager. Nice. Where bef just before, well, about a year and a half before I left, I wrote the menu. Uh, with the other bar managers, but predominantly me working with Hugh, one of the owners, wrote the cocktail list, spent a lot of time working on all the deals and kind of became, you know, not this, and this is not a team in my own horn at all. I kind of became the face of the bars for a little while. Ali was always over at Spitalfields and yeah. Ali Reynolds, for anyone who knows him, you can't take any limelight away from that man. Uh, no. It shines on him constantly. Yeah, um, yeah rip it off you if you... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ali would admit to it too. Yeah. Um, but, in terms of dealing with the, the, the kind of the logistics of being yeah. a big bar operation. And I loved it. It was amazing because, again, Hawksmoor don't sacrifice on quality. No. And they, they do have a big belief in understanding what happened before, yeah. what's going on now. What was it? Is Ali's trend. background? Is he match? Ali, no, Ali's not match. Ali is part of the, the Brass Monkey set from, from Nottingham. Right. Uh, so him, Adam McGurk was there before right. he came to match. Uh, Gareth Evans, global absolute ambassador. Mm -hmm. Um and a handful of others. Uh, and then he came down to London. I'm not sure where. I think he worked for Jason Atherton before he came to Hawksmoor. Right. I think he was at Pond Street. Um, and then, yeah, came on board. And, you know, like he is a great bartender. He's, yeah, yeah. he's very world good class. at what he does. World class UK winner. Um, and then went to work for Diageo, as often world class winners do. Now, Johnny, Johnny Walker. So I, I don't know if he's lesson. strictly Johnny Walker anymore. I think he's kind of. All of the, I don't know how they've, you know, all these different yeah. catchwords, prestige, yeah. deluxe, yeah. Uh, super on trade, yeah. mega VIP. <laughs> um, but that man knows his whiskey. Uh, him and Colin Dunn, who uh, is, you know, yeah, he's a big player in the whiskey world. Um, they work very close together. He does incredible masterclasses. And I think, you know, one of the things that, I'm not going to shout out Ali too much, but one of the things that Ali does really well is he makes whiskey super accessible. He makes it fun. Yeah, he absolutely. He takes the yeah. stuffy old man in a suit thing out and, and just kind of talks about it like it is. It's just good liquid to play with. Don't have to drink it neat. You put, yeah. it, in a, put it in a cocktail. Awesome. So yeah, at Hawksmoor, we, we, you know, I did a lot of work on the menus. I did a lot of, a lot of boring back of house stuff, learning, mm. the, learning the ropes of how bars actually operate, um, especially at that scale. Um, and then it came to, yeah, just over five years in and I needed a change. Yeah, you know, five, five years is a long time. It's a stint. Yeah, it's a stint, and I think I became very aware of uh, something that, as a manager, you have to be aware of, or as anyone in in an industry where promotions occur, are you blocking the pipe? Are you stopping other people from progressing by just holding a position? Yeah. Uh, and whilst you know, by that point, I had four kids, um, it was important for me to have that stability and a decent paycheck, sure. which was all there. But, you're still doing shifts at this time, bar shifts at this oh, hell point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would make a point of at least at least once a week I would go and rock dispense. Yeah. Um so the way Air Street structured is you've got a front bar which is just for drinking and a little sure. bit of dining, which we which we changed whilst I was there and we've got kind of a bar menu in place and some specials and all the rest of it. Um so there was the bar and then there was a dispense bar. Right. Uh, and for, for non industry people, by dispense we mean no customer service. You're yep. not talking to guests. It's just expediting just drinks, make for, drinks for tables. Yeah, uh, and that one bar, which was a, if, one of my favourite bars ever to work on, would serve all the cocktails and all the hot drinks and all the soft drinks for all 240 people. Nice. Um, Do you have a bar back? Team of bar backs, <laughs> Spanish squad, um, <laughs> but not with you 24 seven. Um, yeah. So I'd pull people in and out, and often we'd have someone on a floating shift. So you'd have one bartender there fixed. Yeah. Uh, and then people would check in for the little rushes, predominantly the coffee rushes, because right. on that kind of handover between the first sitting having coffees right. and the second sitting coming in for their cocktails. Yeah. So you would get absolutely annihilated. Um, nice. But it was great fun. And that was a big thing for me was to keep my technique up. Yeah. Uh, and also, I think in our, in our game, it's tough to respect a bar manager who can't make drinks. No, of course. What was the training program like at Hawksworth? I, I helped a lot with that. Uh, it was... It was never uniform across the whole group. There wasn't like a first Tuesday. Flex, no, like so match. I tried to implement that a little bit more. Yeah. I started bringing a lot more brands in. I started doing a lot more testing. Um, in fact, if you pick up the last of the Hawksmoor books, there's 
a really beautiful little uh, setup of me teaching you how to do round building. Nice. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we tried to standardize it, but again, if you standardize too much, you become a chain yeah. and you take out personality. I think the point was to standardize recipes. So if you went to Spitalfields on a Tuesday for a drink yeah. and ordered an old fashioned. I think classics need to be standardized. Exactly. Across what, and, what was the reason for not? Itself. I mean, chain's not a great word, but if you, a group like that, you kind of, there's a level of quality that you expect and that you know you're going to get, which I, I think is a positive yeah. thing. I don't. So yeah, the, there was an induction um, and the induction was run you through the cocktail list, run you through the kind of the, co the core concepts mm -hmm. in terms of whether it's the beer offering, the wine offering, whatever. Um, but Hawksmoor always had a focus on personality mm -hmm. and people. Um, and that's really, I think, one of the things that has stood them in such good stead is they put a lot of time and a lot of money into letting people be people. Yeah. No uniform, like every, per every person is allowed to be themselves. There was no standardized way of talking to people. And... I think that filtered into the way that we dealt with drinks. But when I was started doing a bit more of the group stuff, yeah. I did try and implement a kind of bit more of a standardization just because for me, a big thing was we had quite a lot of regulars across the group. So you wouldn't just have regulars at Air Street. You'd have people that would go to Hawksmoor's yeah, so two times a week yeah. and it'd be seven dollars on one night, Guildhall next weekend, and they'd go and do breakfast. In fact, there's a, there's a group of guys, I don't know if they still do it, that once every couple of months would do every London Hawksmoor in one day. Jesus. Yes. Breakfast, I, lunch, dinner. I, I worry about their arteries. <laughs> um, they used to eat a lot of meat. Oh, Jesus. Um, so we did start doing a bit more standardised training and we did put kind of more emphasis into the bar manual and how mm. we would do things. Um, and I think, you know, just after I left, Liam Davey came back on board into the group bar manager role right. and he's had a lot more... Um, time because i was running air street and doing the group yeah. bar manager stuff he, that's his job yeah he just does the group stuff so liam, i think he has liam done a bit more of that match liam was in match. match through and through wasn't he for yeah a very, long time. very much so uh, let's have a chat about the drinks at, at hawksmore there was a few interesting things came out of there like yeah. the fat wash old fashioned yeah stuff. was, that, so was that a hawksmore original or yeah, yeah yeah that's that's adam mcgurk um straight out of air street uh that was uh the full fat old fashions right so we would butter wash bourbon right uh, we tried to always do overproof bourbon, so it had carried a bit more weight. Yeah. So that was combine a bottle of bourbon with 140 grams of clarified butter. Okay. And then what'd you do with it? Uh, pop that in a sous vide bag. Nice. Cook that for a couple of hours at about, I think we did about 60 degrees. Then let it come to room temp and freeze it so the butter would separate out. Yeah. Drain the bourbon off and you'd have this really rich buttery bourbon and we didn't put any bitters in so it wasn't really an old-fashioned right a uh, little bit of sugar stirred that down over ice but it was you know and uh, that drink stayed on the list yeah i've had forever many of very good. um it goes down an absolute treat and the butter afterwards we'd always give to the chefs to go and have fun with um pastry chefs used to absolutely oh, love yeah, us for that it must be delicious yeah um so that was a big one and then i think peach, you know the, ginger brew. yeah the, <laughs> The, the drink that is synonymous with Hawksmoor is shaky peach ginger beer, yeah. which is, you know, uh, arguably, whilst it hasn't spread as much as an espresso martini, it is a modern classic. It's, yeah. it's global. Um, Pete, shaky Pete himself, Mr. Pete Jerry, he lives over in Australia now, and he, I think he's in the process of turning it into a canned cocktail. Oh, really? Um, so the drink itself, which is, is a phenomenal drink, it's uh, like a, a healthy measure of gin, yeah. double shot of lemon juice, double shot of fresh ginger syrup, Blend that with five ice cubes, always five ice cubes right. from a Hoshizaki machine. Um, and then top that with with ale, London Pride. Um, absolutely smashable. Check out the um, Bonville Cocktail Collections, five top beer cocktails <laughs> for a demonstration of that. I don't think we blended it, actually. I can't, I can't remember. Oh. Um, but like, I mean, that's a great example that when I came on board, I... Um, asked a couple of friends to go and try the other Hawksmoors out to check the shaky beats. Right. And it came up quite quickly that everyone was making their ginger syrup differently. Oh, really? And when you've got a, an ingredient that, that is that integral to a yeah. drink, it couldn't be that way. So did, as you should do, the full empirical method, got everyone to bring a sample of their ginger syrup in and the methodology, and we sat through it, and we all talked it through and got very heated about who's was better <laughs> um, and agreed on one recipe that we all went forward what with. What is your that. recipe? I'll be interested to hear this. because So I was... for me, the ginger syrup we did for that, which I, I stick with as being a great one, but the point is, and this is important to note, we went through a ton of that stuff. Right. So it probably doesn't keep as well as other recipes. Right. It was um, roughly peeled ginger. Yeah. Put it through a centrifugal juicer. Yeah. Two parts of the ginger juice to one part of sugar, not sugar syrup, 
sugar. sugar. So you're okay. making a real syrup. There's yeah. no added dilution yeah. in there. And you'd need to stir that. Um, and really get it to incorporate because okay. it would take a little while for the sugar to go yeah. through. Um, but that was it. So it's rough and ready. It's got a lot of heat on it. Yeah. But it's fresh and it, it pops. Yeah. Um, That's exactly how I make it. I think I, I go one to one though. So yeah. ginger juice and cost sugar. So the, the point is there that there's other recipes where it, it will keep a lot better because you'll have more sugar in it. Or you'll some people would put like a like a, a shot of vodka into a litre just to keep it. Yeah. Which for me, arguably, if you're having to add spirit to keep a syrup for longer, make no. less syrup, otherwise yeah. you're making a liqueur. Um, so yeah, that was the way we did it. And that was that was the one that gave the most vibrancy, the most fresh ginger flavor to it. Um, I know that uh, back in the, the old Wild West days of, of early Hawksmoor, that wasn't the recipe. Um, so it might, maybe, not, is it, maybe not quite the original Shaky Beach Ginger Brew, but things evolve yeah. ever so slightly. And I think that's all right. Yeah. I mean, I think I spoke about this I might have spoken about it on a vlog that I've since not released. <laughs> um, there was I saw loads of recipes on online on YouTube, other other YouTube cocktail channels yeah. making penicillins, yeah. and everyone's making their ginger syrup differently. Yeah. Um, but referring to uh, regarding cocktails, Sasha's Sasha. book for the recipe, but they're not making the ginger syrup the same way that it says it in the book, which yeah, is it's just a big deal for the penicillin absolutely. Well. It's you know, a Before quarter of the drink. Sorry, I'm getting this PD. Um, so we'll pick that up from... So the drinks program. The drinks program. Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, the drinks program at Hawksmoor in general was always uh, really interesting because it, it was all about understanding drinks history and making it relevant. And yeah. I think one of the things that I loved about Hawksmoor, I don't know if the newest menu since I left still keeps with this, but it was understanding that it was a cocktail list for a restaurant, mm -hmm. not for a bar. So okay. it was set up in a way that it was pre-dinner drinking, what to drink with dinner. Yeah. So pre prandial post prandial yeah. and then bridging drinks for kind of people who are coming I think in between. It's very shifts. much become a destina a drinks destination yeah. now though, for sure. Like I was Yeah, but I think that's part of the reason because yeah. it because it fits, right? I think, yeah. you know, like I I've I'm, I've got an obsession with integrity in our industry in mm -hmm. terms of not just having personal integrity, but that an offering should have integrity. So mm -hmm. if if you are a British steakhouse, which is what Hawksmoor is, that is all about eating and drinking, yeah. the menu needs to fit. You can't just put in a, a list that's like Shaking drinks and not shaking drinks. It doesn't fit. It's generic and right. bland. Like you tailor it to the offering, and they yeah. did that perfectly. And I think that that integrity is what's carried Hawksmoor through for so long. Okay. So shall we move on from Hawksmoor? Let's move on from Hawksmoor. Yeah, we stayed a long time on that. Yeah, so, so did I. Five years. <laughs> um, yeah. So so, so Hawksmoor came to an end. Uh, I needed to to kind of to shake myself up a little bit. Like I said, I felt like I was blocking the blocking the pipeline. Mm -hmm. I trained up three bar managers whilst I was there, who'd all, all gone onto other sites. Nice. Um, and I jump boat to JKS restaurants um, for a very brief stint right. and I'll gloss over them relatively quickly because I was only there for a very short yeah. small, small amount of time I opened up their restaurant Brigadiers in the city um, just around the corner from Bank Station uh -huh. helped them set up a really fun whiskey list we had a whiskey vending machine we did bottled cocktails oh, right, it, was, it was good fun um, but the opening was taking its toll on my family life because uh, I was doing like 90 plus hours a week yeah, and, uh, as, as, with, as you do with new openings yeah, yeah. and uh, it didn't feel like it was going to end anytime soon so I was kind of thinking right maybe this wasn't the right choice mm -hmm. but never regret keep on going and I got a phone call from the NED tell us about the NED so the NED is a 252 room five star hotel in yeah. the heart of the city mm -hmm. in the old um, Midland Bank headquarters yeah. um, designed by Edwin Lutchens which is where it gets the name from because uh -huh. Edwin's nickname was Ned right. uh, it has two private members clubs it has a spa it's got two swimming pools uh, and most importantly it's got like 14 restaurants and bars right. um, it's the first of its kind in the UK there's nothing like it and yeah. arguably even in Europe there's not much like it so under one roof there is an Italian restaurant there's an American bar there's a British lounge mm -hmm. restaurant there's a sushi and, and kind of Japanese fusion style food there's an American deli then uh, and the list goes on and, on, yeah. and a steakhouse and um, they approached me to apply for the head of bars position mm -hmm. so head of bars there entails overseeing 180 plus staff right. almost 200 staff um, beverage turnover of uh yeah, very healthy numbers, yeah. a couple of mil every month. Um, and a lot of work, a hell of a lot of work because it's uh, it's a beast of an operation. You know, it's a hotel, so 24 yeah. hours. Um, always something going on, lots of staff to look after. So I interviewed for that uh, and, 
you know, got the position. Yep. Took over from a chap called Dan Berger who moved back up to um, back up to Manchester. Shout out to Dan. And uh, yeah, spent the last two years of my life. It's been two years. Yeah. Wow. Spent the last two years of my life cracking that whip, <laughs> spinning them plates. <laughs> what were the um, just describe in a nutshell what the style of drinks? Or is it just completely different? Well, so bars? it's part of the Sour House group, yeah. um, which has a big impact on the way it's operated mm -hmm. from a food and beverage perspective. Mm -hmm. Sour House are very much about taking fuss out and right. making things approachable and welcoming. So the drinks are classically styled, which mm -hmm. suits me because I'm a classically styled bartender. Yeah. Like I have a lot of respect for the those luminaries in our trade that do things avant-garde and, and yeah. not like me, but that's just not how my brain works. Yeah. You know, I think if you can make a drink with three ingredients, it's probably better. Um, it's the words I live and die by. Yeah, uh, you know, if you can do sweet, sour and spirit, then laughing. Mm -hmm. um, and every drink is classically styled. No fuss on the garnish. Keep it, you know, as approachable as possible. Mm -hmm. But then having said that, 14 different menus in operation at 14 different offerings. So Malibu Kitchen, for example, which is a tiny little kind of American healthy offering yeah we had to think about lower abv drinks mm -hmm. we had to think about removing as much sugar as possible mm -hmm. using slightly more interesting uh, ingredients in terms of maybe like using dragon fruit as opposed right. to going with the standard apples <laughs> um uh then you've got chaconis which is an italian restaurant yeah. so you know very quickly there i sat down with the bar manager and i said like you don't have a negroni part on your menu you've got a negroni on there but you don't you don't have like a negroni menu which these days what are you doing yeah um, so we put in like a whole range of different sizes of Negronis. Yeah. Um, then over at Millie's, which is the British one, it was really refocused, kind of almost Hawksmoor-esque on using British spirits, mm -hmm. using British produce, following British seasons, because mm -hmm. that's what makes sense for that offering. Back to my point on integrity. Yeah. Um, so whilst the drinks all had the same vibe of keep it as simple as possible, mm -hmm. the variation from one outlet to another and the style of drink was completely different. Um, which was great fun for me having yeah. to write that many drinks. Any, would the bartenders mix and match or was like you work in that bar, that's Every your bar? Every outlet had its own staff, its own team, but yeah. obviously if someone calls in sick and you need cover, yeah. there would be, you know, I'd, I'd say there's probably a, a group of about 20 or bartenders across the building that were very good at jumping in right. last minute. And that was a big part of my job was let my bar managers manage their bars yeah. if they're in the, uh, the weeds yeah then i'll either jump in myself which yeah. is something i tried not to do too much because i can't remember that many cocktail lists <laughs> <laughs> i can remember some stuff my kids names but yeah. uh yeah not that many cocktail lists um but i would have people across the building that i knew i could just yeah. go and grab put them in and help them with all the cross charging of hours and all the laborious back of house oh, stuff God, that you have to like oh, individual, individual outlets oh, yeah man Jesus. um what was what was training like there and, and recruitment? Recruitment must have been an absolute nightmare. Had a team. <laughs> you had a recruitment oh, team. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. The uh, the people in development team at, at, at the NED are uh, superhuman. Right. Um, you know, at any one point, there was always 20 to 40 positions mm -hmm. to fill. Mm -hmm. um, and not because of staff turnover, just because we were growing and growing and growing. Like yeah. when, I, when I came on board, there was 840 staff. When I left, there was 940. Um, well, slightly less. Well, yeah, we'll yeah, get onto that we'll get in a second. Um, so, yeah, I had a team that helped me, but I was actively involved. Mm -hmm. No one would be hired into any bar that I hadn't vetted. How and by vet, vetted, vet? well, I would do all the initial interviewing. I'd do it side by side with the P&D team. And you'd get them to make any drinks? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we used to do things, I inherited this name, it's not my favourite, we used to do master glasses, right. which was, you know, if you've got two bartender positions to fill, instead of doing individual interviews, yeah. Arrange a day where you get 10 bartenders to come in. Yeah. I implemented a theoretical test because I'm match through yeah. and through and I need to know what you, you know. Do you want to talk about your um, theoretical test? That yeah. I used to do? Yeah. <laughs> that so, I got you to do back in, back yeah. in the day. <laughs> so um, I, a test that I've, I've rewritten and you've probably rewritten a few times. Oh, it's so like a Rip bartending 101 yeah, yeah, essentially. Yeah. Like it would, it would have stuff as simple as uh, like what is alcohol? at the very top, right. right? And how is it made to yeah. like describe the process of fermentation? Yeah. And people listening, watching might think, oh, why do you need to know that? Like you buy the spirit, you pour yeah. the spirit. But if you don't understand how alcohol is created in the first instance, mm -hmm. how yeast interacts with sugars, mm -hmm. then you don't understand what you're drinking. It's that simple. Yeah. Like from whether you're drinking a lovely uh, beer or wine mm -hmm. to a spirit, mm -hmm. fermentation is where it will start. So you need to understand that. And if you don't understand that, then we need to get you back to basics. So there'd be that. And then I'd go into 
one of my favorite uh and this is a direct rip off of the match bartenders exam um name the five regions of uh tequila in Jalisco in uh, in Mexico <laughs> and again not always that relevant but I, th I think that I've always thought of the best bartenders have as, as being a balance of three things and yeah. that's and that's knowledge and the ability to host and yeah speak, right? I mean I always use those tests I know it was never a pass or fail. It was no, like, it's not. I need to know who really you are and where you're at. Good gauge of yeah, what what stage you're at, what level you're at, where you need help. Because you might flunk that test, but you might be an amazing host and you might make beautiful drinks and just be you know. And that's fine. And this yeah. is you know again a big part of my job at the Ned was managing the team. So uh, I can think like the great example is one of our bars at the Ned is mm. the Vault, mm. which is part of the private members club. It's Stunning, stunning place. It is the original vault for the bank. Yeah. So it's got the big vault door at the front, two tons of steel. Yeah. Um, and it's a late night cocktail lounge, which gets quite clubby, open yeah. till kind oh, of yeah. three plus AM. And uh, in that team, we had people who were super geeky, like they knew everything about the back bar. Yeah. And then we had people who were super chatty and super lovely. Mm -hmm. And you have to have that. And you sometimes yeah. you get someone who is a really lovely balance of all three, yeah. and that's great. But sometimes you have to have a couple of absolute guns in the team who know how to bash out drinks like nobody yeah, else's yeah. business. And they work the dispense station on the busy uh -huh. nights. And a couple of really lovely chatty people. So I had yeah. one bartender, Scottish lad, who the rest of the team used to get a bit wound up because he was <laughs> rubbish at breaking down his station. Uh, but he would hold the bar. Right. So on the nights when they were getting slammed, he would entertain the, the, the everyone standing in front of the bar. And that would really take pressure off take the pressure off, yeah. and that's a big deal Absolutely, so yeah, yeah that that theoretical test it you know it was quite daunting for a lot of bartenders mm. because you don't get that most places when you apply for a job no um you might get asked to make a drink which was another part of our yeah. interview process but to sit down and me say can you name the three champagne grapes and mm. they go is it um, champagne yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like well okay no it's quite important you know that because yeah. every champagne has a profile and to understand that profile you need to understand the percentage of the grapes mm -hmm. and to understand what that means you mm -hmm. need to know what each grape brings yeah um, so we did the theoretical test and that was loads of fun I used to love marking those uh, and then sitting in the we we do a preliminary chat theoretical test practical and then a final chat uh, and in the final chat I'd go through their test with them a little bit not to pull them apart often to say you know if they were unsuccessful I'd say if you want feedback mm -hmm. here's a couple of things that I would say like take the copy of the test with you yeah. please um, and then I would do a practical thing so I my, my general rule for practicals is um I'd give people an example of where I'm at in my evening, like a role mm. play. So I'd say, look, I've just turned up with my missus. Okay. We're about to go for dinner. Yeah. Um, and she would love something to get her palate ready for, for the meal. <laughs> and it's what's interesting there is because you're not just testing their technical ability to make a drink mm. or their knowledge of drinks. It's how well they know how to place a drink. Yeah. So the person who's like, I'll make you a right grasshopper yeah. before dinner. You sit there, you're like, oh, that's not. not really what I'm yeah. feeling. Like someone, most people, if the amount of Italian bartenders they interview, they go, oh, do you like Negronis? It's yeah. like, Anything else? Yeah. Um, well, the grand is. This is a great drink, yeah. and as, and you know, again, it's one of those drinks that you, you can't fuck up, but you can make a bad Negroni yeah. if you don't know what you're doing, and it's it's interesting to see how they balance that. Oh, you can definitely fuck up with a Negroni. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, but my my point is that everyone, you know, you've got the purists that are like it's 25 mils, 25, 25. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that. You can rebalance yeah, if you're absolutely. using a stronger gin, then maybe you're gonna bring the gin down a little bit. Yeah. Or, anyway. Uh, so I'd do the pre-dinner drink, I'd do a post-dinner drink, mm -hmm. and then I'd say, and this was always one of my favourites because it really puts people on the spot, I'd say, I'd ask them a question, I'd say, like, who's, who's your hero in life? Don't say mum and dad, who's your hero in life? <laughs> and you'd like, sport person or musician, or yeah. sometimes you get a really interesting answer, like, bartender I hired once said John Steinbeck, who's my favourite novelist, and I was right. like, don't worry about it, mate, Just, yeah, you've got a job. <laughs> um, and I'd say, right, they walk into your bar, what do you make them? Yeah. Oh, nice. And... It would take a couple of minutes for people to go, what? It's like, John Steinbeck walks into your bar, you recognize who he is, this is your moment to make a connection with your hero. Right. What do you make them? They ask you for anything, they just say, make me a drink. And that would always be really interesting because you'd get, some people would go really experimental and mm -hmm. totally mess it up. And some people would just lean on a classic that they know really well, but use the best spirit they can find yeah. and really put a lot of love and passion yeah. to it. And that's really telling because you know that shows me their their kind of on-the-spot creativity, mm -hmm. which is a really big thing for a bartender, mm. how, how you react to that. Okay. That actually leads me quite nicely onto the a question that I wanted to ask. So t two years at the Ned, five years at Hawksmoor, kind of like the most senior person in the bar. Who, and I'm not fishing here, who did, <laughs> <laughs> who, who did you look up to? Who was your sort of 
inspiration, mentor, you know, or is it you kind of just left to your own devices? I've got multiple mentors. I think, you know, and uh, this this is not this is not responding to your fish, but you were my original mentor yeah. in, the, in the cocktail game, and I've always leaned on you as someone throughout the years, yeah. whether I'm working for you, or not working for you. There's always been the occasional yeah. message of like facing this issue. Yeah, you think. but I very much got you to a point, and there was like, and I think I probably said it to you, like I, this is as this is as far as I'm going to be able to take you. Like you need to go spread yeah. your wings, and yeah. Um, Following on from that, there was there was always a handful of people, and they weren't always bar people. No. Um, in fact, Will and Hugh must have been. Yeah, before. yeah, Will and Hugh, the owners of founders and owners of Hawksmoor, were phenomenal. And you know, I I I, I know we spoke about Hawksmoor loads, but it's worth noting those guys employ seven hundred people. Mm. Till the day I left, they remembered the name of all four of my kids. Oh. So they wouldn't just say. Oh, how's family? Yeah. They were like, oh, how's Lily doing? Yeah. And it's like, do you know what? That means something. And that, and I learned a hell of a lot from them about people. Yeah. Um, so I think I had different mentors for different things uh, throughout my industry time so far. Um, but then, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? My, my mentors live in books more than anything else. Um, I spend as much time as I possibly can reading, which when you work in our industry and have four kids is quite hard. Um, and you know outside of yourself and a handful of other people that i looked up look up to there are some there are some people in the game that i always was arguably inspired by who they were and what they got right. i think like if if i was to kind of run off a list of names someone like jeffrey morgenthaler over in the states okay. who um he has been running the bar at clyde commons in portland for as long as i can remember yeah. um the man makes great drinks with no fuss you know, if if I he, he's he, his is one of the books I give I give new bartenders. Yeah, have you ever tried one of his drinks? What, what by him? Yeah, no. Oh. But, <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it, whether or not his drinks when he makes them personally are the best thing in the world, his philosophy about it yeah. and the way he presents himself, he's not pretentious. No, absolutely, in not, the slightest. No. And that no. for me is a really big. I, deal. He might make amazing drinks. I don't. Know. I've never. I had think he probably does make quite good drinks. I don't you think that though, be, and then you, I don't know, you get a drink. Well, I never meet heroes, right? It's, I, in bartending, it is, it is never. There's never been a truer word said. I've been really. I'm not going to name any names, no. but you know. Yeah, yeah. I've been disappointed a few times. Knowing looks at the camera. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, yeah, but you know, I think never meet your heroes is a big thing, and I think in the bar game, I'm, I'm not looking to learn how to make drinks from these people, like not being arrogant I know how to make a good drink yeah. I can balance a cocktail uh, but a lot of it's about philosophy isn't it isn't it, it is about yeah. philosophy it's about approach and I think a big thing for me in our game is removing pretentiousness mm -hmm. whenever I possibly mm -hmm. can I really hope I had a big part of big yeah part no you absolutely did do that. you know we, 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 were, we were smashing out treacles and, and stuff but we had a bijou on the list yeah. when I first came on the electric yeah. and that is a drink that's steeped in history yeah. and is very bartender oriented but it's a great drink yeah. um, quite a lot of passion fruit martinis as well <laughs> do you remember my last shift Let's talk about that another time. <laughs> go on, go on. Can we talk about it? Yeah, why not? I don't, uh, I don't remember it. But. So it was it, like, I think the thing at uh, Electric House was people were really into uh, passion fruit martinis. Yeah. And uh, we had a table that were going through them at a rate of knots. Mm. And because I was leaving and because I was a cocky little idiot, I thought this would be really funny to see how, mu how much I can get away with. Oh, by not having any booze. I think it. the last three rounds of six passion fruit martinis were 50 mils of passion fruit syrup, 50 mils of passion fruit puree. Per drink, that was it. Great TP. No booze. <laughs> oh, you know, you dash gave me a lot. I gave you something back. Dash for so maybe. Sorted out your GP for the month. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think kind of with the hero thing and the mentor thing, um, I'm not looking to learn how to make drinks from these people. I'm no. looking to look at how they approach the industry mm -hmm. and what what they value more than anything else. Yeah. And with people like Jeffrey Morgenthaler or even Sasha Petrask, right? Yeah. Like the guy, rest in peace, Sasha was was mad in a lot of ways, yeah, yeah, yeah. but. Christ, what he started, I mean, we're sitting in essentially a speakeasy right now, and that's... Well, Sasha didn't invent speakeasies, but... No, but he brought them back into the <laughs> forefront of the, yeah. of the bar yeah. world, right? Yeah. And, and he did it in a way with absolute, back to my previous point, pure integrity. Yeah. From start to finish. But couldn't make a drink to begin with. No. But he had a vision, yeah. and he brought in great bartenders, and he gave bartenders the ability to make great drinks. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like the, the bartender's favourite thing at Milk, which... Sam and Mickey to this day still do at Attaboy. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, listen, if if Dale hadn't walked into Milk the day he did and they hadn't got that relationship and then Milk had never come to London, yeah. 
it's a good chance neither of us will be sitting I, here I now. I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, so, you know, I, I look at people like that and I think you model yourself after what they aspire mm. to, to aspire to do and aspire to be. And I think it was, for me, you know, if what you're doing is is being done the best you can possibly mm -hmm. do it, then you're someone I want to model myself yeah. after. If you're doing it for the right reasons and you're yeah. putting the time in. Yeah, let's let's have a talk about that if if we may. Like, wh how much importance? Uh, uh, it's kind of a leading question, <laughs> but I'm not. T I'm not. Sh it's not a shit test. But what? How much importance do you think is what's in the glass compared to the overall? customer experience like is you answer and then i'm gonna i, I see one. i see where you're yeah. coming from I, I i think you can't have one without the other and be successful but right. i think is, is the first well, you thing absolutely can unfortunately <sighs> yeah i suppose you can yeah i suppose yeah. you can i suppose you can but, but like chetty for example yeah like, massively arguably the most successful yeah bartender in the industry right now his drinks aren't for you though no. No. But, you know, and I think there's a lot of subjectivity in our game. Yeah. The theatre of a drink is arguably more important to a lot of guests. And I think that one of the things you have to do in this conversation is redefine success a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. it, success is not just measured in, in money. It's, yeah. it's in longevity. And milk and honey okay. is yeah. a very, very good example of how that can be measured. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact it's about to close down, yeah, and you and I are going for a drink there within the next couple of weeks, yeah, we have to. Um, it's been there for eighteen years, yeah, and they've never really changed the list. It yeah. might have gone up and down a little bit here and there, yeah, I think so. It's... But the Florador has been on there since day dot, <laughs> pretty much, right. And these drinks are all classically formed. They all use citrus. Yeah. They're all shaken with ice. Yeah. They're all served in glasses or like a a glass, not a thing or a whatever a, a like weird vessel and that's success like it's still looked to as arguably one of the pinnacles of our industry right yeah. so it might not make the most money out of the entire game you know jj's boss lcc yeah. they're not my drinks like so I, i'm not that it's not the sort of drink that i want to drink they're very successful and mm -hmm. i think that he's got a longevity to it because he has got a balance of the party atmosphere and you know he's, he took the lab model right yeah. which was it's not about the best drinks in the world it's about having loads of fun and having decent drinks yeah so there's I, definitely a place in the world for that without yeah. a doubt there's you know but i would argue that to kind of i don't know if i'm going against myself or, or backing myself up i think for me success is defined in knowing that you've done the best thing that you can possibly mm -hmm. do um and being and, and holding that integrity and finding your audience and pleasing them in our industry yeah so like i'm not going to open some avant-garde i don't even people, if people even say this anymore molecular mixology bar it's not what i do i yeah. wouldn't be able to do it properly right no like there are bars in london that have been open for quite a long time now that do slightly more scientific drinks I'm thinking of one in islington yeah um still there still there yeah Get a good classic in there as well. You though. get a good classic in there, yeah. but they do. Like, there's a lot of science involved in their their their, their listed drinks. Yeah. Um, but it's done the best it can possibly be done, yeah. and it has a market that like it. Yeah. Um, I think that if you recognise what you're trying to offer and you do your offer the best that you can, mm. and the audience reacts well to it, and you carry on doing that, then you're in a good place, right? I, I do think, and I've said this quite a few times, especially kind of over the past few years. You can cover up average quality product with excellent service. Yeah. You can't cover up terrible service with great products. There's a there's a differenti differentiation there though, isn't it? Because if you're serving something and this is like, this is the shit, this is amazing, this is the best you're gonna get, yeah. and you're like, this is it's not. But if you're trying really hard, like and I've tried my you know, someone's tried their best, they've given really good service. Yeah. And they probably know that it's not the best drink yeah. in the world. There's a there's a difference there. I yeah. feel like, and yeah, someone's really given their all, and and that's the best that they can possibly do. But it's not it's not that great. But they've really put their heart and soul into it. People buy into that passion, though, don't they? Yeah, 
And that's the service side of things. That's the, yeah. do you know what? He's lovely. Like, it might not be to my taste, but yeah. what a lovely place. And the atmosphere is nice and they've got yeah. lighting right and it's soft and it's comfortable and I want to be here. Yeah, yeah. And there's, you know, you hear a lot of bartenders talk about, you know, you know, trying to be creative and be experimental and, and yeah, stuff so like that. I've just been managing a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. But, and you, but, but they'll put lists out with stuff that, that isn't, you know, they're experimenting on. Whereas, like, if you go if you go to a restaurant, a chef would Why put it on, the put it on ready. until it's ready, and they would taste it and try it and refine it and get it better and better. It's like, well, we're gonna, let's put that out there and see what the customers think. It's like, no, they're not gonna. Then it's not gonna happen in. But there's the food world. There's a there's a broader argument there that the chef doesn't get to explain it when he's doing it. So whatever goes out on a plate, once the waiter picks it up from the pass, yeah, that's the involved. That's the chef's involvement done, right? Whereas with a bartender. Mm. You can walk back over there two two sips later and go. Mm, I think you're enjoying that too much. Let's walk you through it a little bit, and then it's not necessarily a good thing to have to explain if something's crap. But you can interact and you can talk through it, and there's that service side of things. I'm not. I'm but not. If you have to explain why this drink is crap, then why? Then why did you say? Why did you serve it? Place? Yeah, well, yeah. because everyone's got. Oh, that's how it's taste. <laughs> but, but I've had this conversation with people, and yeah. you know, like managing at the net, uh, running. All those different bars with different bar managers, different head mm -hmm. bartenders, and different mm -hmm. bartenders where we're putting lists together. And I think, you know, whenever we did a list at any one outlet, I would say to the bar manager, it's not just me and you writing this, I want yeah. your team involved. That would open up a lot of hard conversations where someone would be like, I don't know, I've, I've done a char grill passion through and then I've made a core view and I've used this and this and this. And this. Mm -hmm. so I'd sit down with them and go, Have you tried buying that product first to see if you can get it better? And they go, oh, yeah, but homemade's better. It's like, well, not always, especially not at scale. Or, yeah. you know, I really like this combination of mezcal and, yeah. I don't know, like, fucking yeah. pear juice. And you're like, well, I see what you're saying, but 99% of people won't like that. So that's very subjective to your palate. And I think you have to work through those processes. And it is the job of whoever's at the top of that bar yeah. to say that's not good enough to go on the list. Although you do always have or on a list. We've, you've got a seven-figure monthly drinks turnover are you going to be able to recreate that right exactly the there's, there's a lot of factors but i think you do always on cocktail lists reserve a spot for testing the audience okay um to some degree like as long as it fits within the rest of the offering it's not like you have like we're on the same team when it comes to a hundred percent like make me classic cocktails well before yeah. you start playing and this is also a big thing that i did with my bartenders was i would randomly test them all the time right so you know, obviously I wouldn't do it when they're in the weeds, but if I thought someone had a bit of time, yeah. I'd put I'd put an, I'd either put a ghost order through, so I'd order from a terminal or for a present table, nice. or I'd just go one-to-one, -one, I'd go up to them and, and ask them to make me a Manhattan, or I'll yeah. just make me a classic, but they don't make a lot, but they need to know. Sure. Um, and daiquiris, you know, the go-to. If you can't make a great daiquiri, then about this bounce. Time, so we'll, um, we'll hold off on that. Yeah, we'll hold off on that. Uh, so... I don't think that experimental position on every list is necessary, but I think it's something, if it fits with what you're doing as a bar, I think it's quite a nice thing to have. Uh, you can do it through specials, like that's yeah. what we did at all we did, because you couldn't change the menu, the menu was fixed and it changes yeah. every year. Uh, but, you know, I had a blackboard and I'd do little in-house competitions and I'd let people put their drinks on the board. So I was just about to ask you about that. What did you, did many of your guys go into competitions? Hawksmoor really liked putting bar bartenders into competitions. Most of them came from Spitalfields because that was the bar bar. Um, but I pushed a lot of my bartenders. And in fact, one of them, Vince, uh, shout out to Mr. Vince Smart. Um, he has done incredibly well. He won Shivers Masters. Wow. Um, and when I first got him, he was not good. <laughs> he had all the makings of a great bartender, yeah. but no one had ever trained him. So he worked under Phil Duffy at Fox and Ballon. Okay. And he was desperate to get into Hawksmoor. And Phil called me one day. He was like, "Listen, man, I, as soon as you've got a spot, you need to give Vince a chance because he needs to work up with you." But they not have a cocktail program. Like, like, yeah, yeah, but it, it's, it was like a neighbourhood, and they, right. the cocktails were very limited, right. and it was all like free batch everything. Right. And like it was because they, they didn't have great bartenders, so it was, and you couldn't get great bartenders to work there. Yeah, but he was the general manager. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. So, so you know, funny. yeah, I think he's done that. We've done that already. <laughs> yeah, um, so you know, Phil says to me, like, I, I can't train him. I'm the general manager. I just don't have the time. Yeah. Um, and he's desperate to work at Hawksmoor. Like, if you have a spot, bring him in. Yeah. And I did. And I, you know, I had to break him down a few times before I could build him up. But I had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, I've got a lot of respect for him because he 
you know, well, he won Shivers Masters with a Floridora twist, and I know who introduced him to the Floridora. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he's he's phenomenal, but he needed a lot of breakdown yeah. rebuilding. And he's, yeah, we did a lot of comp stuff. What about the Ned? The Ned, yes. So we did loads of internal competitions. Okay. I, tried to, I tried to do one every month. In the building or the whole group? In the building. Right. I mean, the Ned is a whole group in itself. Yeah, like, I guess. We, we, we had access to Soho House competitions, but they've got a lot of bartenders. We got a lot of bartenders. And to be honest, I didn't really see the value in pushing my team to go out to Soho House when there was so much we could do in house sure. to develop a community and a culture. Yeah. Um, so I do monthly, I essentially I set up a first Tuesday rotation. Okay. Um, first Tuesday for people listening was part of the match training program where the first Tuesday of every month you do a spirits training and the following Tuesday you'd be tested on it. So we did yeah. that the following first following Tuesday. Month, you'd be, yeah. yeah. Um, we did kind of a first Tuesday thing. And I get, sorry to interrupt. Did you get much time with Mark Bridgewell at, um, very limited, no. a couple of couple of sessions. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ledge. Legends. Um, so I, I implemented a bit of a system of that where we do a first Tuesday kind of thing, and then the following we I give them three weeks. Mm-hmm. So after three weeks, we do a competition. So we do a brand training. Yeah, we'd outline the competition rules. We give them three weeks to make their drinks. We do the competition, uh-huh. and a week later we do the next first Tuesday. Right. Um, and that was phenomenal, and that actually fed into. So for example, when we did the Bacardi training, we I set it up so. It's, Two months before they launched Bacardi Legacy, so it was a build-up to Bacardi Legacy. Right. So then my bartender's going to buy Bacardi, Bacardi okay. Legacy, having already worked on a drink that they were happy with. So basically, we did Bacardi Legacy in house, nice. um, and that you know I think the competition side of the industry is really interesting because I think that there's a lot of validity to it, but I do believe that it's done a lot of damage to our trade as well. Do you think? Yep, I think that the egos that come alongside the competition bartenders. Right. I think you meet a lot of bartenders out there who only run the competition circuit and right. can't actually make good drinks and can't run a busy shift. And if you call yourself a bartender, yeah. bartender. And it's, I mean, this is going kind of going back to the conversation we were just having, but the best drink doesn't always win. No, no. Rarely wins. Very rarely wins. Yeah. The, the drink that hits the brief might yeah. win. Uh, and I would say that there are probably some brands out there that don't play the game very well and do a little bit of insider trading on making sure that certain accounts win. Uh, well, the prize these days is it's to become, and, and, but it's always oh, you get to become a brand ambassador. So it's not only it's a massive can, investment. Can you make a big drink, good drink, or or can, can you, you be, work for can us? you be a good brand ambassador? Or will, you, will you champion the brand? Yeah. But then, arguably, that's where Shivers went right. Um, Vince won it, but he won it with a great you know, like no two ways about it. It yeah. was a great drink. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think to be fair to the brands out there, like. I don't envy them having to work out the right way of doing advocacy because you're investing so much money. Well, I mean, is there any advocacy left now? Well, I mean, that's a big conversation, part of the COVID thing. Come on, let's get on to this then. Let's do it. The, <laughs> let's do it. It's the main reason. And I'm glad we took so long to get here, actually, because uh, we've had a nice chat. But so essentially, you're no longer at the NED. I am no longer at the NED. So we start kind of from the beginning of, of well let's uh, just say COVID. you've been i've been made redundant, you've been made redundant. well i mean officially right now i'm, I'm not you're, i'm, you're I'm, I'm on work, furlough. furloughed notice yeah. um so yeah so covid started emerging in the mainstream media yeah everyone started getting worried yeah um yeah let's go back to like january january for reads yeah so i think that if we skip past january because i don't think january anything was people were talking but nothing right. felt nothing felt solid right we were everyone was like ah it's in china yeah like, nah. Um, February's things started getting weird. I think we mm. all started noticing it. It started erupting more in the news and people were talking more. And a few of us were saying, like, this is coming for, for our industry. Like, this, we're going to be. Was, you were saying it back then. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if, I think, you know, I had a handful of conversations with people where I was like, if this really does hit England, our industry's in the poop. Yeah. Because you got to remove people seeing each other. Spending time with each other, mm-hmm. and that's what we are making that money out of. Yeah. So March was where it really, like, kind of around the first week of March was when everyone started really going, "Oh God!" When did you sort of get? Like, was there a, a, an official memo from from the from the powers that be? Yeah. Uh, XCOM. Um, no. So they were communicating really well. Like the net operates much like most big businesses, very much via WhatsApp for communication yeah. these days. So the, the management groups were going off every day, like this is what's going on. Every single day when there was a press conference, um, Gareth the MD or one of the um, directors would, would post something up saying, this is where we're at, we'll keep you posted. And I think this was, you know, God, I'm so bored of these words, but the uncertainty of it all, yeah. it's impossible for anyone to manage perfectly. 
all you can do is be up to date and talking about not now back then be up to date with what's going on sure. and react accordingly yeah. right so proactively those of us at kind of my level the head of department level and above we're having conversations about right if we do have to shut down what we're going to do yeah. how we're going to manage this yeah shall we start shutting down sites like outlets before because we're noticing a drop off and really i'd say the first week of march right. is when we started seeing a drop off people becoming nervous yeah um because offices started shutting down before restaurants did yeah and the ned is in the heart of office town yeah it is in the belly of the beast center, center of the city of london yeah. it is literally at bank station so you know for a month before the 24th of march when we were officially shut down by the government um we were seeing a drop off and it's like right do we start closing out mm -hmm. do we start kind of reducing our offerings so we're cutting back on our payroll so that we can keep places busy or do we stay as, as weak as it was and we slowly started reducing opening hours and kind of doing what we could to, to mm -hmm. mitigate risk and to mitigate cost. But at the same time, like you, you know, you didn't want to say to people, oh yeah, you can come to the net, you can only go here. Right. Um, so we were, I think everyone was really cautious. Um, we handled it, I believe, as best we could. I was communicating constantly with my entire team. Mm -hmm. um, but I could only communicate what was communicated to me. It's not my position to kind of take anything in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, we saw the drop off. And I think there were a few whispers when around the industry. Like I think you know, let's say the eighteenth of March, maybe a bit before mm -hmm. next week, they're going to shut us down. And what a few of us heard it. I spoke to the MD. I spoke to my the FMB director. Yeah. I was like, have you heard it? Yep, yeah, we've heard it too. So we started preparing for it. But obviously, you can't pull the plug without the government pulling the plug. No. So we went to the twenty fourth, and Boris went up and shut us down. So I mean. <laughs> For those that don't know, I had bars until uh, late last year, and I like, massive survivor got a little bit over the over the whole. Dodged the bullet, yeah, really dodged the bullet. Um, so just tell me, what is that? What what was that like? Like what's that that day? That's weird. Like the man. day where you just don't go to work, or you well you go into work and just see, but you're closed, or so yeah. So the day when they announced it, he announced it with the five o'clock briefing. And right. said you can stay open for the rest of the evening, which I would argue was a massive mistake in terms of uh, what happened. Uh, yeah, no, I remember this though, yeah. Right. So not it didn't happen to us, but across the more rural parts of England, yeah, and the like slightly more outside the cities, those were the biggest parties we've seen in in <laughs> the UK for yeah. years. People went and got absolutely off their jobs. Packed out pubs, packed yeah. out nightclubs, packed out everything. Yeah. Bad idea. Um so we we stayed open until closing. You know, we we like we just we just be open until we, we would normally close. Mm -hmm. People people naturally started leaving. In fact, I remember quite clearly that five thirty, people kind of left. And so, but you got two hundred rooms at the net as well. So two hundred fifty two. So uh, they were almost completely empty by the time we got there. Anyway, right? People stopped travelling a okay. lot a long time before that. So uh, yeah. So what was the deal there though? Like the any guests left, and you just like package. Sure. But you know what? I, I stayed out of that. I had enough right. to keep. I had enough on my plate. Right. Um, the hotel, you know, the, the way the Ned operates is you've got hotel, you've yeah. got F and B, yeah, pick a beverage. And whilst we cross over, in terms of the management of it, like you can have that. Like that's, yeah. that's, we we keep it separate. We right. keep it distinct. Yeah. Um, and again, I think they dealt with it really well. David Lockhart, the the, the Hotel director is, is an incredible human being and he's he's very good at managing people and I, you know, I think anything that he did, he did the right way. He's been heavily involved in the reopening in terms of health and safety and yeah. implementing new systems and technologies to make it work. Um, and yeah, that last day was really weird, was really big. Like the, the last week, I'd say, building up was just thinking back on it and obviously this is emotional memory as well. Everything felt very grey and very quiet. Very yeah. still. Um, and, you know, for... Those of us more senior, I think, you know, we've been in the game a little bit longer than most of the staff. We're a bit more resilient to that stuff. All my bartenders, my bar backs, like a lot of them are in their early 20s, yeah. not from England. They were terrified. Yeah. Especially, like, I had a lot of Italian staff at the Neds. Mm. And Italy really was getting hit horribly at that point. Really you know, I spent a lot of time having really heavy emotional conversations with people about their grandmas and about their mums and their dads yeah. and the unemployment. And, you know, and I, you know, personally, like, send people home. And said, like, you need to get back on a plane as soon as you possibly can. Mm. Because if we do go into a lockdown situation, you're not going to have the option. Um, mm. That was really heavy stuff. And, you know, and yeah, 
it's weird because a lot of conversations we're having about COVID these days are in the past tense, but we are still in it. We're still in it, yeah. Um, it, what is it? We're almost 23rd today, just yeah. to, put, to put this conversation 20, in context. 24th. Yeah. Whatever. In well, August. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was just very, very strange. So then uh, the following few days, obviously this is before the furlough scheme had been announced or right. decided upon and everyone was still getting paid for what they were getting paid for. Yeah. And was, so Friday night, that was it. That was it. And then Saturday morning, just can't be open. Yeah. So uh, we, a few of us went in. Yeah. Me and some of my bar managers and a handful of people because obviously you've got all that stock, all that produce, all those fridges, produce, yeah. like every cellar needed to be cleaned out. So and at this at this point, what what are you thinking? Two weeks, three weeks? No, nah, like I'm I'm a I'm a, a, a not a pessimist. I'm yeah. a, I'm quite a cynical realist in a lot yeah. of ways. So for me, I was like, we need to be prepared to be closed for months. Right. That simple. Great if we reopen earlier, yeah. but be prepared to be for closed, closed for a very long time. What was the company line? Are they pretty much the same? same yeah. Pretty much the same. It's like it's like you know. I think that when you're managing a place that has that much holding stock mm. for one. Uh, that many staff and all the rest of it, you need to go into it thinking worst possible outcome. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we went in, we cleared out all the sellers, we cleared out all the bars, we put every bar essentially got moved into a hotel room that got locked. Right. So all of the stuff, all of the equipment, everything that you could take off the bar that wasn't the bar itself, yeah. got put into a hotel room with like fully written down inventory. Yeah. That got left with the security team. Right. Door got locked. And this was just over the course of that couple of days, yeah. yeah. A couple of days. Um, and then it was right, go home and wait to hear what happens next. And I guess you're in the city, so there's no like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of small local businesses sort of move pretty quick. So I did yeah, the so I did the takeaway stuff. And there was a lot of conversation, but you know what? The Ned did one thing really quickly, really, really well. They got involved in uh, catering for the NHS right. within a matter of oh, fantastic. So they had, they got kept people on board. The kitchens were operating because obviously massive kitchens at the yeah, and like the ability to create a hell of a lot of food. So well, there central, some, centralized kitchens where it's all just individual. The way the Ned operates, there's a couple of big kitchens and then a few smaller ones. Right. Um. So like Zobler's and Kaya um have their own kitchens that are visible over yeah. kitchens. Malibu the same. Millie's and, and Nickel, which are two, the two big boys on the ground floor, they come out of one big kitchen. Yeah. They also serve lunch in the steakhouse. But and then there's a like, the downstairs prep kitchen, which is I mean, I'd love to show you that place one day. It's insane. If they ever let me back out, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so they they reacted really well. They brought a lot of team in. They were producing thousands of meal, meals a day for the yeah. NHS, um, and that was yeah, that was a testament to, to Gareth Bannon, the managing director, and the whole of the executive committee. Like, they got on that quick yeah and that's brilliant it's amazing and it kept some people employed for a little while as well um but then the furlough scheme kicked in and that was that was it it's like right stay at home we'll do some zoom meetings here and there yeah we'll tell you what we know when we know it um real so i got to be full-time dad which yeah. is great um nice. you know and i think you know i have to say that Ned did everything they could do throughout the whole process they they communicated when they had something to communicate mm -hmm. They made it very, very clear that if you needed to talk to someone, you could. They yeah. set up a, a relief scheme for people who were struggling financially. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, much respect to them. They, they, like, for a company that big, where it's very easy not to look after your team, yeah. which I think a lot of big firms are not very good at looking after people. Yeah. They did everything they could do. Anyway, I guess it was, I mean, what you sort of gave me a shout, I don't know how long ago it was, was a month, six weeks ago, something like that. A bit more. A bit more. Yeah. Saying you, you weren't sure what's going on, if you were going to go back, or yeah, um, there hadn't been any sort of serious redundancy. Oh, no, so right? that, oh, if, it, if you're talking about then, that would have been, yeah, two, two plus months ago, because the redundancy process, when it kicked off, took seven weeks until, right. until the decision. So we got, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, so what, so one Friday afternoon, I think afternoon. I got an email to my personal email account yeah. saying, uh, you're invited to a Zoom meeting on Monday morning at 9.30, you don't need to prepare anything. And I looked at it and I turned to my Mrs. Erica and I said, I'm gonna be made redundant. And she said, no, you don't know that. And I said, look, I know the game, I know the industry, I know how much money the Ned needs to make to keep people on board. Yeah. And I know that if, when it comes to reopening, whenever that might happen, you need bartenders, chefs, waiters and cleaners. Mm. Everyone else is, you know, not that important. As much as I like to think of myself as a really important human being, you don't need someone developing cocktail menus and doing training sessions. Right. You need people to get food and drink to people, and that's about it. I, I remember you, 
we were chatting around this time and I, I think I, I don't know whether I said to maybe what was the possibility of taking a pay cut or taking a... Yeah, so this is... Like a demotion or something? For, for... So the redundancy process so for anyone out there who's had to go through this is uh, it's long, it's drawn out. And if you're doing it for over 20 people, there is a full process of consultancy that has to happen. So um, everyone that was nominated within the food and beverage team had to choose one person to speak for us in consultancy sessions. Right. So we would speak to them individually. They would take their questions and suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me personally, I didn't want to step down because me stepping down would mean somebody else would need to step down. Like I'm not gonna, there was no role for bar manager open. And I'm not gonna do that, you know? And you know, there was there was some junior people in the, the redundancy list who were like, oh, why can't you just fire all the waiters? And I was sitting there in these like group chats when we were having Zoom calls and saying like, that's a horrendous thing to say. Like yeah. you're a slightly more experienced person. You're in a managerial position, which means that you probably find it easier to find another job when the job market comes back online. A lot of the waiters and bartenders are young people who've just moved to England. Yeah. Like, do you really think it's fair? And also from a more practical perspective, someone on hourly pay doesn't have to get paid as far as business yeah. concerns. Like they, yeah. you, you can give them less hours and oh, it's, it's a controlled yeah. variable cost. Um, so there was conversation. There was like, are you, are you willing to take a, a lateral move? Are there any lateral moves available? No, cool. You know, lots of the Ned really tried to make it as fair as possible. Yeah. But I said to my, my 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 missus and my closer friends from the second that it happened, I was like, me and these two or three people who were the most senior people on the list of potential redundancies, I was yeah. like, we're gone yeah. because this is about money, yeah. nothing else. It's not about skill set. It's not about who you are as a person. It's not about how well liked you are in the building, yeah. you know. And I believe that wholeheartedly. It's about how much money can we save with as few cuts as possible, yeah. and that's fair. You know, the business has got to do what the business has got. To do. Yeah, they got shareholders to answer to, and yeah. yeah. Man. Um. So you know, a lot of, I think, I think I I was a bit disturbing to some of the other people involved in the process. How calm you were. Yeah. 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 Um. You know, it came at a time when I felt healthier and more centered than i'd ever felt for years and years and years um, and that came through kind of studying stoic philosophy and other things like that but i allowed myself one day of emotions um where I, when i found out that i was definitely being made redundant right. um which i knew was coming and i had this i had a zoom call with the the head of hr who's since left herself uh and she cried she was like i'm really sorry you've got four kids and then and i was sitting there i was like it's okay like this is it just is what it is mm. um and i'm sure people out there these days will say well you know you're speaking from a point of privilege and blah 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 and it's like well whatever really like it, it me being upset doesn't improve the situation mm. me stressing out is not going to make my missus and kids feel very safe mm. um it's going to make the next step much harder. a lot harder much harder you know and and i you know i, I don't know if i'm space it should do this but that I will I will say to anyone who's facing an issue like that, there's a book called The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, okay. which we'll put in the show notes, which helped me inordinately deal with this. Right. And, uh, you know, I just, I, sp I spent a lot of time talking to myself about like, it's not the end of the world. Mm. If I need to become a bartender again to make some money, I'll be a bartender again. Mm. If I need to go and clean like houses, I'll clean houses. Like yeah. I'll, I'll find a way to bring money into the house to make, to keep my kids safe and alive. I might not be in this really like awesome best bar job in the world type position, yeah. but I got two years in. That's good work. Okay. Well, I mean, that's it's admirable that you've handled it that way, and it is. It's ob it is obvious. I did give myself one emotional day where yeah. I basically lay in bed and cried. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, let's let's talk about how. Let's leave you for a minute yeah, and how yes, you're going to move on. We'll, talk, we'll, go, we'll come back to that. But let's talk about what's so what, how, how the industry is dealing with it. And I guess we're sort of both looking in uh, from the outside now uh, to a certain degree. But let's have a chat about, I mean, have you been out? So, yeah, I, well, this is this is what I think is really interesting. So there's a lot of doom and gloom, right? And I think both of us, I'm, I'm now almost essentially off social media, but both of us, our social medias are blocked up with people in the bar and, bar and yeah. food world. Yeah. 
and there is an insane amount of doom and gloom and it's understandable because people are losing their jobs and they're scared for their livelihoods yeah. and not everyone has been able to kind of embrace a stoic attitude or look at things objectively or realize that this has happened before and humanity survived yeah. like if you look at the spanish flu it's way worse yeah. um but uh, like i think that there are some real genuine silver linings out there like so i live up in north london yeah. in a, in a in a quite nice leafy neighborhood you live in in the deepest of souths in a quite nice leafy neighborhood and we're surrounded by little pockets and villages you live in the ghetto yeah. he wants to live in the ghetto um and uh if you go to more neighborhood areas seem to be doing all right to me yeah um I mean, obviously, places like the Ned, which is uh, rely on people going to work, going to offices, yeah. they're screwed. And I, and I think, kind of having to face up to that, I feel, I, yeah. I genuinely feel for them because but, there's not much you can do if there's no one around. No, there is very little you can do. But you know, now is the time for these smaller independent local businesses to shine. I was saying to you, there's a, a bar up the road called Drink at Bob's. Shout out, Drink at Bob's, um, Hiver Green Lane they are having record breaking sales because they're I think first of all they're the they can have a lot more seating outside so a lot of those restrictions have been lifted they haven't had to put in 10 notices and stuff yeah. like that they're just allowed to put some chairs out and and I, this is a theory of mine I've not fact checked it at all but <laughs> get the lawyers down some yeah but but you know you got people aren't going to work or don't, people aren't leaving the house at half six to get to work. Nope. So they don't have to go to bed at half nine. So they can go out for dinner and drinks on a Tuesday night locally. And they want to. Yeah. That's a really big so thing. That, so, that we're, so there's not that big, busy Friday, Saturday night anymore. It's just kind of steady, steadily f at capacity, uh, although a bit reduced capacity, yeah. but seven nights a week. Arguably, we're shifting into a more European way of eating yeah. and drinking like i think you know and i think this is really important and i want to see more of the food and drinks press talking about this stuff because mm. it's it's no joke like people aren't going back to work for a long time we know this like the, a lot of the offices have said we're not returning until either early 2021 yeah. or even mid 2021 yeah. and even those that are returning are talking about massively downsizing the amount of in office time people yeah. will spend which means that people get to be at home right yeah. so it means that this last few months where everyone's been based in their area and only being allowed to walk kind of 20 meters in any one direction and yeah. has got to know their area a bit better, they've reassessed their priorities. Yeah. They want to spend more time doing more wholesome things. Yeah. A lot of them have found their health. Yeah. This isn't to say- My missus got a six pack in lockdown. <laughs> Fucking ridiculous. Uh, dude, I lost nearly three stone. Yeah. Um, uh, 16 kilograms for all the non stone <laughs> users out there. Um, pounds, you're doing pounds. You're doing pounds, yeah. Um, that isn't to say, and we should definitely disclaimer, like there's been a lot of heartache and a lot of loss and mental yeah. health has suffered for a lot of people and, you know, like they're not going to dumb that yeah. down. But I personally am someone who believes that we should always try and focus on the positive and what's good because yeah. we all have to keep on living, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's talk about the negative for a moment. For a <laughs> I mean, listen, there's, uh, you know, we, we touched on it before, but there's some, I guess the big one for us is milk and honey in London is... Sad times. Closing its doors on the 26th of September. Um, Sad times. Jonathan Downey, the owner, has been championing, championing the in industry. The, the, yeah, as a whole, really. Started this. Um, Never one to stay quiet, Mr. Downey. No, and he, you know, he's been campaigning for landlords to reduce rents or yeah. freeze rents. Yeah. Um, time out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think many people have had much luck. And the government, you know, arguably has not done very well at putting pressure onto landlords. No. For whatever reason that might be, Boris. Then where does the where does the buck stop? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, my heart's with hospitality. I want yeah. hospitality to to thrive and survive. And it breaks my heart that milk and honey's not going to be with us for for much longer. Um, but yeah, where does who who take who takes the hit? Is it the yeah. government? Is it the landlords? Is it the banks? Yeah. Argument should be that should be the banks. They got bailed out not that long ago. Yeah, yeah, they got given a fair bit of cash, didn't they? Yeah. And now maybe it's their time to step up and help the economy out. But you know, I think you've made a, bit, a little bit of a list of other other places. Well, that are I mean, the ones that kind of stuck out when I was looking around were 
you know, milk and honey obviously is is a bit of a headline for you and me because we both have an emotional attachment to it as yeah. a bar and the respect that we've got for it. But yeah. when you look at kind of bigger numbers, you've got Pret a Manger have closed over thirty of their four hundred and ten sites. The Casual Dining Company, which is Cafe Rouge and Bella Italia, have yeah. closed ninety one out of two hundred and fifty sites. Eat, which you know anyone who's worked in the city has definitely been to eat. Yeah, they've closed all of them. Ninety sites, Fun. boom. Um, Starbucks up to 400 in the UK alone. Now, I don't think either of us are here, sitting here saying, oh, those poor shareholders, that's a lot of people who've lost their jobs, yeah. man. It's people that are not working. And, and you know... Argue- and producers, like, yeah, you know... Suppliers. Dairy farmers and, yeah. you know, coffee yeah. pickers. <laughs> <laughs> the beer milkers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a massive impact. Um I, I, this is the thing you know i'm i am not an economist so i don't really under, I, don't, I don't really know how to look forward into what does that mean going going on to what's next um how do you what do you feel personally what do you i mean you know i went to a pub the other day had a great time mm. we ordered drinks off an app they yeah. came really quickly i mean i i really hate the whole qr code thing but yeah. that's just because for me hospitality is about hospitality and, and a lot of what's going on with social distancing which is vital yeah. removes hospitality from hospitality which is yeah. which is a struggle but so so i live in north london and i walked down to shoreditch yeah. uh, it's like an hour and a half walk in total and every little boozer on a side alley that wasn't part of the city right. was doing great yeah. like all the little cafes were doing great yeah. like there's people in them um like yeah absolutely places are going to continue to close and i think a lot of the big boys are going to have to do some major cutbacks yeah well, they Gordon Ramsay just announced he's opening 50, 50, 50 outlets. What, what's the crack there? Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, we spoke about this before we were, before we were talking, but I think that I think that he's probably going to go in and sweep in and take a load of these dead sites, isn't he? Like yeah. Pizza Expresses and Starbucks. Well, probably not Starbucks, but there's going to be a lot of empty buildings that have already got kitchens, kitchens in them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, t- it seems... Uh, it, uh, it's either gonna, it's either going to pay off massively or it's gonna backfire backfire but so the, you know the two there's two big camps at the moment isn't there with the kind of what happens next for our industry and one is the camp that i think i belong to more which is um like i think neighborhoods are going to thrive and yeah. i think small independents that, that know how to operate are going to yeah. do really well yeah. um and i think that we're going to see kind of the decentralization of of big cities a little bit which won't be permanent because obviously the world will come back and offices will go back to some degree and tourism will return. Yeah. Um, then there's the other camp that says like the big boys are going to sweep in and take every site and roll chains out into all the neighbourhoods and it's going to be, you know, just... Mm. I, I don't know. I, I think I think there's been a bit of a zeitgeist shift as well for, for the average person that yeah. wants to support someone that they know, a face yeah. that they know, like drink at Bob's. Like yeah. you want to go down there because you want Bob to have a thriving business. Yeah. So if, for example, like let's say Be It One, right? right. Massive bar group, mm-hmm. originally started by four bartenders. Yeah. So when it first started, it was like respected by the industry to some degree. It was yeah. like roadhouse crew and whatever. Um, if Be It One started trying to roll out into every neighborhood, I don't think it'd be received very well. No. No, I agree. And I think restaurant wise, it's a funny one, isn't it? We were talking I think we were talking about Franco Manca the other day. Like Franco Manca is a great group yeah. that started off small in Brixton. Yeah. They've grown. I think they might do quite well. Yeah. But they would be providing good local business and they're not feeding into some massive major shareholders as far as I'm aware. They're still relatively Well, in essence, you know, they're probably giving thirty percent of their takings to Uber Eats and Deliveroo, yeah. so those yeah. people, those groups are gonna. That, but that you know, that's that's inescapable, right? Yeah. Like that's, I, I and I don't know where that ends. I don't know if as social distancing disappears, mm-hmm. if that dies off and people stop ordering in so much. I kind of hope it does a little bit yeah. because I think that it's encouraging a slightly unhealthy attitude towards food and yeah. spending money. Well, let's have a chat about some other schemes that are going this um, help out, eat out to help out. Great initiative. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, I've never been one to back the Tories, but Rishi Sunak had a very good idea. Um, uh, I think, fantastic idea. Like yeah. it's, it's, but my concern is, and I think we're seeing this now as it comes to a close, we're only a few days away from the last day of it. Has it just given everyone a weird sense of false hope? So all those places in the city that have started seeing people coming back, mm. they're just gonna disappear. Yeah. I mean, and this is all, Withstanding a second lockdown, like who knows? Who knows what's going to happen there? 
Um, I'm banking on no second lockdown, even with a big, even if we have a, some kind of second spike, I can't, I just can't picture the government saying, it would be a nail in a coffin, man. Yeah. It would be like economically, like just yeah, no chance. Let's have, a, let's have a chat about this. No more, no shows. That well, that's a big deal for our yeah. game, right? Like I think we've always everyone who's worked in restaurants and for those non-industry folks out there, when we say no show, we're talking about you make a book and you don't turn up, yeah. right? Now, without any, without any prior warning. warning yeah. And what people have to understand is when you make a booking, you're essentially saying I'm going to come and spend money at your joint, yeah. and if you then don't, yeah. you have cost that amount of money, yeah. right? You can, especially nowadays when there's a lot less footfall, there's a lot less walk-in trade. Yeah. Those bookings are the only way the business can predict whether or not it can survive for the next. And so, I mean, I'm sure you've got friends who've done it. I know I've got friends who do it, who make multiple bookings and then choose on the night which one they want to go to. Scum. Scum. Scum on the earth. Like, I, I actually had not an argument, but a heated conversation with a friend who did that the other day. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's a joke that I think a lot of us make in this industry. I think Anthony Bourdain said it in one of his books. Rest in peace, Anthony Bourdain. Um, Everyone should have to do service in the food and in food and beverage game. Yeah, like national service. Like national service. Everyone should have to do six months. When they yeah. finish school or during school, whenever, everyone should have to do six months before they go into the working world so they have a little bit of understanding and respect for the for the game. Yeah. It's, it's not a fun place to be most of the time. People think it's glamorous, but it's uh, it's tough work. It, it is, and <laughs> it's just part of the job, isn't it? I think what, now I'm a bit old and jaded by the whole... Bit, well, no, not jaded at all. I loved it. Um, but yeah, you, it's just one of those things that you're gonna get knobs coming into your establishment, and especially around Christmas when oh, mate. you get it's people, yeah, and you get people that you, oh, you, you don't go out, you don't yeah, go yeah, out, yeah, yeah, yeah. you only go out at Christmas, and you yeah. don't know how to behave. Yeah. Yeah. Hawksmoor Christmas one year, I watched one guy crack onto all three of the women in his office party, uh, and by the end of the night, he basically got slapped by all three of them as well. It's yes. like you're not allowed to come out anymore, mate. Yeah. All right, so let's. What's next for Max? What's next for Max? Um, I'm going to keep on trying to be really positive about stuff. I think, <laughs> like, uh, I have uh, done a few interviews yeah. and looked around, and then some a, an opportunity to help out a restaurant came up. Yeah. Uh, as in, do some consultancy, right. and I've never done consultancy before, yeah. but I did know someone that had, yeah. so I gave you a shout, didn't I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. and um and we started that process together and yeah. i've got a couple of other kind of uh like peers in the industry that i like to bounce ideas off people who are good entrepreneurs mm -hmm. have skill sets far outside of my own experiences far outside of my own who are quite level-headed people and as i spoke to people about what i'm going to do next one theme came out which was do you really want to just go back into what you've been doing for the last 15 years because it's been very frustrating for me at times like I, I've, I've been in the game long enough that I have a, quite a good understanding of what I think things should be done like and it gets quite annoying when you're making a large amount of money for someone who isn't respectful of doing things the right way and I'm not saying that's an Ed or Hawksmoor or anyone but there's been moments throughout my entire career where I felt frustrated with it as we all do bosses yeah. are hard work right um so I'm working on this potential consultancy thing with you I had uh one of those funny weird sleepless nights where an idea keeps on bouncing around your head yeah. And um, I think what next, what's next for Max is opening a consultancy firm. Shout out to Still Truth Hospitality Solutions. This guy. <laughs> so yeah, you and I are, are developing our own firm. Yeah. Um, the idea being not just beverage focused, although both of us come from a bar heavy background. Mm. I mean, I, you know, you, the, your last place that you ran was definitely not entirely wet focused. It wasn't just a drinking destination. The food was incredible. Um, both of the pubs that we ran together had, I would say, some of the best pub food that you could get in East London at that point. Like, wasn't yeah. tr wasn't trying to win any awards, but it's damn good food. It was solid, yeah. The beef wellies were on point. Yeah. Um, and I have run a lot of food operations over the years, and I, and and I'm a passionate, passionate person about food. Um, I, you know, I actually think one of my one of my things about working in the restaurant bar side of the world and the hotel bar side of the world is getting my teams to understand that we're not the uh, we're not going to win the Oscar for for. Um, actor, we're going to win the supporting actor role because right. that's what the bar is in most of those things. Yeah. In a restaurant and in a hotel, yeah, the bar isn't yeah. the focus, it's the hotel and the restaurant. That yeah. people are coming to eat, right? Yeah. In a restaurant, people come to have a meal. Yeah. So the drinks have to be the supporting role in that. You yeah. can you can outshine the food, fine, on the night, but remember that you're there to support. So I think with our consultancy, it, we're not coming in there saying, we're going to come and write your cocktail list. Yeah. It's, 
we look at everything, get everything working. top yeah. down and bottom up yeah. and comprehensive really understanding the whole thing and uh you know with with our experiences together i think we stand a very good chance yeah. of helping some people open new things or reinvigorate things that need yeah. reinvigorating yeah. so yeah distilled truth hospitality you excited absolutely yeah. nervous <laughs> absolutely um you know i think you know like i said multiple times i've got four kids yeah. you've got kids yeah. um you know we need to make sure that money is coming into the bank account and rent is being paid right but uh, I believe that we can do it. I think we're going to make some mistakes along the way. No. Nah, no we made them already, right? Yeah. No. That's, the, like that's, nearly... the, that's the first first rule is uh, don't, yeah, don't think you know it. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and you know, know, I think, you know, to anyone, anyone who's out there listening, listening who's looking for consultants, we will definitely not make mistakes on your job, but <laughs> we'll try. Hopefully, to hopefully I've made enough of my own to uh, yeah. not make any. But no, I'm, I'm really excited. I think I think the future looks incredibly bright um if you choose for it to be there is one quote that i wanted to talk about as well so uh there's a a bar in east london right by old street uh that goes by the name of Terran elementary it's run by monica berg and alex retainer who are the two bartenders at the top of their game alex retainer was running the artesian bar at the langham hotel for two years when it won one best bar in the world um two years on the trot man only other bar to do that was milk and honey in the savoy oh interesting yeah uh, and Monica, his partner, uh, we did an interview with the Cocktail Lovers the other day. And she said that when the meteors hit Earth, most of the dinosaurs died instantly. And the ones that survived didn't know they were going to die. But the conditions had changed so much they were already extinct. It's the, it's the same way for the industry in general. It's really, it's really bleak. And I think it's completely wrong. Okay. Um, and I think that you know, if if I don't I don't know Monica personally, I know Alex. But if I were to bump into her, I'd tell her that she needs to retract that and realize she that. Right here. Yeah, but if, when you sit in a position where people listen to you, yeah, that's damage, yeah. man. That's damage. There's a lot of people out there that are terrified, and I think that I totally understand that she's, she's really terrified. she is terrified, and that she's got absolutely every right to be scared. But to make such a damning statement of the state of the industry is yeah. really really dangerous. Is she like that right? Yeah, I mean, she she spoke about the fact that they're reopening and they've had to, they've gone through some really hard times and it was been damaging for like her personally and that is that's really intense, man. And I, I like hats off to her for being so candid and so honest. But like, she will survive. She's very good at what she does. She will find a way to do it. And I understand where she's at right now. But um, I think there's a lot of people in our industry, not just in the UK, in the world. Monica's an international bartender that look at her and listen to stuff like that and take it really seriously. And yeah. I think that. If that's the filter through which you look at this situation, you are putting yourself in a whole heap of hurt that you don't need to be in. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's not people are going to be running, running for the hills in the industry, aren't they? If they if they believe were to believe that. Exactly. All right, mate. Do you want to end on a higher note? End on a higher note. Absolutely. <laughs> Come on, let's do some questions. We got some. Uh, yeah, man. So I had uh, the viewers of the Still Truth YouTube channel put some questions to you hello people on the distilled truth uh, youtube channel <laughs> um ethan benjamin how did you become a bar manager we've covered that I hard bloody work ethan yeah. hard bloody work austin shadix uh question for you, max for you and max both sometimes it's a random night at home you just want to get plastered <laughs> but you want to still have a cocktail along the way and not just drink straight pours uh, of your liquor of choice what is your go-to drinks for a drunk night in, especially relevant during lockdown? Alternatively, do you have a drink you order? Okay, let's answer that first and right, then we'll question, go on to the second question. question. What's, yeah. my, what's my go-to drink at home? I don't drink a lot at home, okay. but when I do, uh, I'm a beer and whiskey kind of guy for the most part. Yeah. Um, I've got a handful of whiskeys I've collected over the years that I absolutely love. Yeah. Uh, shout out on that one to Compass Box No Name. If you ever get a chance to try it, so good it's like drinking like it's like drinking silky smoke it's amazing right. um so like a really good quality beer like something from the kicking horse uh, oh no, not kicking horse from the harbour brewery guys and, and a good whiskey if it was a cocktail yeah, which is uh, he's asking if it you know if we want to yeah or a beer i suppose because beer is definitely would, would be my yeah drink of choice um i probably wouldn't go something sour for a cocktail at home mm. um Nothing that I have to put too much effort into. Right. Uh, so, 
I love an old pal. Right. An old pal is, and uh, I think one day I'll come and make make you one of these on your other channel. Uh, is it's like a Negroni meets a Boulevardier, okay, but with dry vermouth. So the way I do it, I do forty mils of rye whiskey, yeah, twenty mils of dry vermouth, right, twenty mils of um, Campari, right, and a little splash of orange curacao. Stir that down and yeah. serve it on the rock. Sounds fucking horrible. <laughs> Trust. <laughs> You'll have to make me one. Um, okay, what would I have to do? What would my cocktail be at, at home? I'd go rum based yeah. daiquiris, mojitos, I guess. Yeah. Summertime in the winter. Yeah, old fashioned. Treacle. Treacle, maybe. Yeah. 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 But I, I think it's a common misconception. Well, is it common misconception? I don't know. What, bartenders but bartenders. Chefs don't cook at home, bartenders don't make drinks at home. No. Very, very it's rarely. We've all, got, we've all got the stuff to do. We've all yeah. got all the POS in the world yeah. that we've been given through various brands. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you spend 45, 50, 60 hours a week making drinks at work, you get home and your missus goes, make me a margarita, babes, and you go, make your own. No, I've taught you enough. I've missus margaritas. You do? Yeah, because I, I can't bear to watch her do it. Have you ever made her a toy at all? No. You'd change her world. I make, she likes picantes. Does she? Yeah. Yeah. Who doesn't love a Picante della Casa? It's a good drink. <laughs> it's a great drink, man. Although you wanted to have a conversation about margaritas being overrated. Let's save that for another time. Save that for another time. A little teaser for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ne <laughs> next episode, Max versus Quantro. All right, so Austin's, uh, second part of Austin's question. Uh, do you have a drink you order to judge a new place before you're ordering something more niche or complicated? All right, so if it's a cocktail bar, which I'm guessing is what he's referring to. I assume so, yeah. There is an... I am not the only person to say this. I believe that Sasha says it in regarding cocktails. Yeah. Order a daiquiri. I think Dale told him that. And then, yeah. 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 So. Now, the reason for that is, Austin, uh, a daiquiri is made of three parts. Mm -hmm. Strong, which is your spirit, sour, and sweet, yeah. right? It is very, very easy to make a bad daiquiri. Yeah, nothing to hide behind. Nothing yeah. to hide behind. And, you know, arguably, some people can make a good drink that can't make a good daiquiri. Yeah. But... And there is a little bit of pretentiousness in being like, oh, I'll have a daiquiri, please. And something I train all my bartenders is if someone comes into the bar and the first thing they order is a daiquiri and a beer, it's a bartender. There are other drinks you can order. Anything that's a simple drink, and if it comes out unbalanced, you know where you're at. Yeah. Uh, daiquiri, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, daiquiri, obviously, is, is my... What was the one... Do you remember that one very shady night that you and I went out and smashed about 17 bars and then tried to eat a steak at Hawksmoor? Clover Clubs. Yeah, I've we gone off them a little bit. Yeah, I've gone off a little yeah. bit. It's a good drink. Too many. It's a great drink. But yeah, we ordered clover clubs at every single bar and the variants across oh, God, the bar. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Someone yeah. put right, blackberry jam in one? It's like, yeah. Yeah. anyway. Do you know what? It's funny. I was, well, I was having this conversation with someone recently. I might have been on a video. But I started drinking clover clubs because White Lady is one of my favorite cocktails of all time. So White Lady is certainly one I'll do to yeah. shit test a bartender. Yeah. Sazerac is another one as well, just to oh, see. Yeah, it's great drink. Actually, previous question, Austin. If I was gonna have a cocktail, it's a Sazerac. That's that's my that's my jam. Oh, at home. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Um, but I started drinking Clover Clubs because because no one could make white good white ladies. Yeah. So. And raspberries cover yeah. that wrap up, right? Yeah. A little bit. So apologies if I've ever ever ordered a Clover Club off you, because I probably didn't think you could make a good white lady. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thinks, oh yeah, Rory loves Clover Clubs, but yeah, right, no, I do love Clover Clubs. Don't, let's not be. It's, it's a great drink. It's a great drink. Yeah. It's fluffy and pink, yeah. man. Yeah. All fluffy pink drinks are good. Right, who's next? Who is next? Yip Jim Jim. Question to Max. Do you mind customers asking you to make something off the menu or create something interesting? Or do you prefer them to order drinks that are on the menu? Yip Jim Jim. Uh, two things. Number one, I don't refer to them as customers. They're guests. And okay. because they're guests, and that is an important thing, customers go to shops. Uh, guests go to bars and restaurants. Uh my job is to look after the guest. So if the guest wants something off menu, a bit interesting, I will do that for them. I've got a lot of time for that. You know, if I've got the time, if if it's a very busy night with three deep at the bar and someone comes up and goes, make me something interesting. Yeah, listen, there's got to be some caveats to yeah, that, surely. Course. But, that, but that's when it's all about just saying to them, look, I'm really busy right now. Yeah. How about I grab you uh, X, Y, or Z and then I'll come back to you when everything's cut. Yeah, Strawberry yeah. daiquiri is, is my go-to for- Ish bash bosh. <laughs> East State hold up. Yeah. Um, like, it's about timing but no Christ I mean if, if 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 you ever meet a bartender that gets funny about asking for something off list order a beer or a glass of wine and go somewhere else yeah I think it very much depends what they what they're asking for it, it, it is 
It's like, have you seen that video shit, bartend, shit, shit people say to bartenders where it's like, make me something, make that one thing that I had yeah, that one time at yeah, that one place. It's like, there's there's stupid questions, but the, the simple question of, can you make me something off list? Absolutely. Yeah. I have uh, the, the, the blessings of remembering lots and lots of very wonderful classic cocktails mm. that people haven't always heard of. Yeah. Um, Floridor is always my lean, yeah. my lean on, because you can make it with any spirit. Yeah. Um, as long as that person's prepared to answer a couple of questions, just make me something doesn't get you very far. Make me something followed by a lovely conversation about what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. That's that's going to take you a long way. Unless it's referring to a mocktail, oh, but that's know. another that's another that's conversation. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, and that also might beg the question: maybe your cocktail list isn't that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you haven't you haven't really, you haven't made sure there's something yeah. for everyone on there. Yeah. And you should. You should. You should have a couple of drinks that that jump out and crowd pleasers yeah. and a couple that are a bit more refined and yeah, yeah bal a balanced menu full of balanced drinks but a classics bar that's the game should, you should make you should be able to make all the classics so that's the game. i think i've every cocktail menu i've ever had or written is always like if the, if you if you, you if there's, some, like if there's you something you want that yeah. you don't see on the menu just ask us yeah. i'm sure we can do it yeah. so yeah um does that answer everything yep jim jim Okay, Asian King, question. Uh, how do you both see the future of bars and to be specific, cocktail bars? I'm not sure if this is referring to current pandemic situation or if it's just in in general. So that's, he's got a few questions there. So that's the first part, let's answer that. The future of cocktail bars I think is cyclical. I think classic bars remain a constant and then you have little movements within that. Yeah. So you get the rise of tiki and then the fall of tiki the rise of something weird and niche like molecular mixology yeah. and then that falls off again yeah. and certain bars will stay from those little peaks mm -hmm. um but they'll be the ones that are not too niche right or so specific and small and perfect yeah. that you know you only need 10 people a night to make that place busy and all right here's a question for you then saying classic bars remain sort of the the rock yeah that we all well, we should all sort of cling to how i think classic bars have changed quite a lot in the last 20 years um all right reverse question then give me an example of a classic bar that would we be referred to as a classic bar now that you would question well like milk for example yeah is that's i mean that's like the new standard of classics okay. if you like so you know if you asked a bartender 15 years ago who or say 20 years ago who's jerry thomas they would have been like yeah yeah you know but then so classic bars would have would have been i suppose like i can I, I yeah 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 so so post renaissance which is you know okay, post yeah. what, i guess that was trying, that's what i was trying to fish out of you, yeah yeah um the pre-renaissance stuff died for a reason the pre-renaissance stuff died for a reason yeah. right the the stuff that um, and when i say renaissance i mean like when milk and honey came onto the scene and yeah. a match bar and, and yeah. like a handful of bars re-evaluated the way cocktails should be yeah. done and where do you think that started? Who do you think started that? Who do I think started yeah. that? I mean, it, it, it's it's Jonathan Downey, Dick Bradsall, it's and Dick obviously came from kind of pre-Renaissance. Yeah, he was the turning point, maybe. He was the yeah. turning point. Him and the Nick Strangeways and Dre Massos of the world as they as they came up, and then over in the states, you had people like Sasha and a handful of other people, kind yeah. of, and Dale, well, Dale being the starting point. Yeah. I mean, drinks didn't exist before Dale DeGroff, did they? Well, he invented sugar syrup, right? Um, uh, Angus Wintester reckons he invented tiki, but that's another, <laughs> that's another subject. <laughs> Shout out to Angus. Yeah. Um, Martel called on Blair and a double espresso at match bar every couple of weeks. Oh, really? Yep. Nice. Um, I, I think the future of cocktail bars is ever changing because it it, it, it it will evolve. Things do evolve, but I think that certain things like making a well-balanced drink and being really accessible and hospitable yeah. won't change you talk a lot about local at the moment i i think that's the future of all bars and all restaurants yeah. i think i think hopefully i hope more than think that neighborhoods get the investment they deserve because people aren't going back to work or yeah. not going back to work as much and people don't want don't feel the need to go into the city that yeah. there might be some areas that kind of have a bit more of a a pull for more people coming across but yeah. you know I, I'm I'm a, I'm a funny one though because you know I don't really play the social media game and I don't like I've I've fallen out of love with the hype of world's fifty best bars and stuff like right. that. I think for me it's just about focus on what you do, do it well, and if you can captivate a great local audience, that's what you should want. Yeah, everything else should be irrelevant. So okay, let's 
approach this from a different angle then what do you think of the public's opinion of cocktails is that as the consumer become more educated if they i believe so i yeah. mean with things like wonderful youtube cocktail tutorials out there there's one that i can think of <laughs> shout out to bonville um there's a few big boys now that we are that we, um, we've, we've got to chase <laughs> I, I i i think they are i don't know how it translates into them going to boz you know, we always used to have back in the day the kind of the barfly set who would come in and order really kind of. Like, I'll have a Puritan, please, or a tuxedo yeah. number two, and and you know that's that they'll always exist. Yeah. The average person who likes watching cocktail videos online does that translate into the way they drink when they're out and about. I think it might do. I think we might have more of a kind of sympathetic relationship with the guests like that because they come in and they have a bit more respect for the craft of the trade and they're a bit more interested in it. What does that mean economically? I really don't know. It's really hard to tell. Um, although, arguably, that some people might say that the more people know how to make cocktails at home, the less inclined they are to go and spend £12 on a drink when they're out and about. True. Yeah, that is true. Once people get wise to what goes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, can't get away with those 80% markups anymore. Not so much. Okay, Agent King's second part to his question: How do you evaluate a bar? I guess we've kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, but well, that was the that was the ability to make a drink. Uh, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, uh, service, man, like it's all about service in yeah. terms of that initial evaluation. Have they got the lighting right? Like, yeah. have they got the the aesthetic right? Do I re do I feel relaxed when I walk in? You know, because there's a lot of bars out there that are very very successful that I don't relax when I when I walk into. Right. Um. And that might just be a personal thing. Yeah. Like, like, you know, I feel out of place or whatever, but I want to go somewhere where I feel incredibly welcome, mm -hmm. where the staff are there to look after me, mm -hmm. uh, that feels well managed and like, the staff are happy. Yeah. And you know, you can tell that quite quickly, I think. You can tell if the staff want to be there and if they don't want to be there. And if yeah. the staff don't want to be there, then I don't really want to spend my money there. Fair enough. And they better make me a good drink too. Decent pizza, wouldn't it? <laughs> Okay, so the last part to this question, which you've already answered, what cocktail would you guys order to see the quality of a bar? Daiquiri, yeah. Miami Vice, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks to those guys for those questions. I've got a couple. Um, if you could run one bar or own any bar in the world, which would it be? Oh, oh, oh. Um, Jesus. Right. I'm going to take the original milk and honey out of it. Or Attaboy as it's known now. Okay. It's because it's too easy an answer. No, not necessarily. No? I mean, that, yeah, that is it's pinnacle stuff, man. Like, they, they got it so right. Um, uh, yeah, I love it there. I really liked uh, Dante in New York as well. Okay. Um, relaxed, casual, like, just drinks are on point, very, mm -hmm. like, relatively simple. There's a couple of slightly more interesting things that Naren did there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, the original milk. Okay. All right, same question, but for any bar in history. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, come on, lads. There's just so many names running through my head right now because I'm thinking like Florida. way back. Nah, but no. nah, Floridita. Well, Hemingway would drink there, wouldn't he? Oh, oh, sorry. I thought not that. Not the one in. <laughs> not the one in London. <laughs> well, not Wardour Street, one. Uh, yeah, somewhere like no. There was a bar that. Twenty One Club. Okay. In New York, had like arguably all of the best authors drank there. Okay. Like the stories that came out of that joint. Right. Yeah, somewhere like that. Florida's is a good shout as well. I think mine would be. Um... I think mine would be the colony rooms in like 94 or something like that, whenever Dick was there, like at the height of Cool Britannia. I was just-, just not, not the Atlantic? Yeah, maybe Dick's bar at yeah. the Atlantic. Yeah. That was a team as but well. I think that- um, That was the drop off though, wasn't it? That was towards- Yeah, and I just remember that sort of being, I was like 14, 15, I guess I was going out, but not like- Not to deep out, bars, Yeah, no, I was going to Equinox in-, in <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he was there. <laughs> um, yeah, in, in in town and that. And then you'd have, you'd be a big big deal. You'd have to get your pinstripe Dolce & Gabbana jeans on and uh, wear polished shoes to go to a club and stuff like that. So yeah. I kind of missed, I didn't know that whole thing was yeah. going on 
in Soho and stuff at the time, like this this sort of London cocktail revolution. And then just, you know, they, those years, like 96 and stuff, just I remember Euro 96 and all that. And all you just the big fights between Oasis and Blur and stuff like that. And, it, you know, I would love to have been in the heart of that, um, see it all going on. But anyway, um, next of my questions, what's the biggest misconception you think people have about running a bar? I think the glamour of it. I think if if you're talking about from the external, mm. like not within the industry, people think it looks like loads and loads of fun twenty four seven. And there, there's definitely an element of that to our industry. Like I don't, I think most of us fall into this game because we like people and we like spending time with people. Mm. Like we're like a bit of partying and the rest of it. But it takes a lot of hard work to do this job well. Yeah, like a lot. Um, and a lot of us spend a lot of time making really bad mistakes. Mm. Um, whether that's going down the road of substance abuse and, and alcohol abuse mm. and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the, 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 it's just a lot of fun. Like, you know, how many friends have I not got these days yeah. because I've worked in this industry yeah. my whole life? I mean, um, weddings and stuff that we've, we've been missed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think, I think people think it's easy. Yeah. Like, you think people that open bars and restaurants that have never worked in the industry you think it's well there's that there's that there's that common thing isn't it exactly that like oh, i really i love i go to restaurants and bars yeah. basically every night like i'm gonna open my own yeah. wine bar or i'm gonna open my own blah blah blah, blah. and there's uh you know it's in europe our game is respected as a career mm -hmm. like a lifetime career you have waiters in their 70s and they've respected people within their their um, community mm. over here it's always been frowned upon because we're brits and we're better than service right that's like a, a, a kind of cultural belief is that i oh, know we're served by people mm -hmm. um but it's bloody hard work and it's it's a real profession like mm. it, it it takes understanding and skill and it, you have to make mistakes and you have to learn you have to develop and um and there are a lot of operators doing it wrong and and giving it the impression that, that it can be done easily when it can't be yeah so yeah all right. Well, um, okay. This is a bit of a down to this question. What? <laughs> what are you most? Okay. So imagine the lockdown hadn't happened. So Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. But we're now. Forget all that happened. What? What would? You, what would you? What are you missing about doing? What would you? Where would you like to be now? What are you disappointed that you're not going to get the chance to do? at the ned or with your career like hopefully there's right ned specific ned there. specific uh and i said this in kind of my um my message with the one social media message i've put out um i feel like there's loads of stuff that i didn't get to do there mm. um i think that my expectation of of what i could get done was maybe a bit mismatched with the reality of right. the situation but you've got that perspective now yeah i've got the, yeah being from being set back but at the same time i feel like there's a lot of stuff that i didn't do that i could have done in terms of developing the quality of the team and helping um embolden people with their careers mm -hmm. so a big part of my career up until the ned was like one-on-one -on -one tutoring and mentorship yeah. and looking after people on a, like not, not looking after but helping people with their yeah. career and it's quite hard to do when you've got 200 people answering into you mm -hmm. um so yeah i feel like i missed out opportunities to, to grow some some people who i believe have got a lot of potential but need support getting that potential to come to fruition um in general like what what regrets do i have of what i, what I can't do now yeah. and I, I don't know that's a hard question to answer because i think that depending on what decisions i make over the next few months and what opportunities come up like i think you've you've you know you've taken it all within your stride haven't you and it's looking onto what's coming up next rather than what could have been I just I, I don't believe in regrets anymore man I, I think I think that you should learn from your past and you should always be very respectful of the mistakes you've made and the and always have moments in your life when you reflect mm. but as the ancient Stoics would say like what's happened has happened and it's happened for a reason it's led you to the point you're at now if you can't learn from that, then fuck you playing that. I, th I added that bit. They didn't need to say that. I think that's a fantastic place to leave it. Max, thank you so much. That was really good. We'll definitely do this again. Definitely. Anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Uh, like so and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> My job. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share. See you next time. <laughs>